tuned in to you call that radio it's wednesday night we've got tom yuri in the house tonight i hope you are well how he's doing can you hear me all right we should be on facebook we should be on youtube we should be on twitch so if you don't know if you've not been on this show before we, re- we reckon youtube's the best place to watch it probably because with youtube you can Hit the subscribe button and you can watch all the old shows as well. Because we've been doing pretty much a show every night since lockdown began. And also Twitch. I recommend Twitch as well. Twitch and YouTube just sound a wee bit better and look a bit better on Facebook. But if you're on Facebook and you want to stay in Facebook, that's also fine. Hello. Yes, this is Dog. Petra in the house. Bro on Twitch. Yep. Usually does sound good on Twitch. Uh, Okay. Hit the share button, everyone, because I think this is going to be a really good show. I'm absolutely buzzing. Tom doesn't really need much of an introduction. You know, you you will know Bob, Big Bob from River City. He's also, you know, pretty much every single amazing show that's came out of Scotland, all the classics, Still Game, Tune the Fat, Karen Dunbar show, Guilt. He's even been in Train Spotting 2 for bonus kill points. He's also a DJ, a singer, a musician. And I'm absolutely buzzing that he's on the show today. So everyone, comment I hit I in the comments. Let me know how you're doing and hit the share button. And welcome to the show, Tom Yuri. I think that deserves a round of applause. Yeah, start with a round of applause for Tom. <laughs> You call that radio. Um, Fucking fucking radio. Here to tell the people that we hear you. One God will not allow. You call that radio. Okay. You call that radio. You call that radio. However, you want to say it, that's kind of part of the fun. Powered by our patrons. Brothers and sisters. They are indeed powered by our Patreons. Shouts to all the Patreons who support the show. I've got to give a shout out to you all. If you want to help support the show, there's a Patreon down there, patreon.com forward slash you call that radio. And if you support the show, you're helping us build a thing. And we will, it's also, you get entry into the raffles, the big mad raffles, some of which are coming very soon. I think it's time we get Tom on the show. Tom, can you hear me? Yeah, man. How are you doing? Yes. Oh, man, Hi. You sound so good with that microphone. It's the same as yours, bud. It's exactly the same mic. Yeah. I've got to shout out more famous. It was more famous who he's a he's a tech tech expert. He used to master the audio podcast and still will when we go into season two. 
Hem issue. Sorry. Hem issue. No, it's uh, season two. Oh, season two. No, I know a sound engineer called Hemishoe. I think that's, I thought that's what you were talking about. All right, no, no, it was more famous. But he just said, this is what you kind of need. I think this is the, he called it like the Joe Rogan mic or something like that. Right. I've never heard it called that, but there you are. Well, I think he was trying to explain it to me in a in a, a language that I understood. Okay. So the, a gid mic. It, it, it's a gid mic. It's a gadget. Again, Mike, it, doesn't, it doesn't require much post production or anything like that. No. Uh, th thank you so much, Tom. Uh, I really appreciate you coming on the show. How has lockdown been in general so far? Um, ah, you know, uh, it's like it's like it's been for everybody. Um, it's been there's been highs and lows. Um, there's been good stuff that's come from it that you kind of wasn't expecting, but it's been rough as well. You know. Um, I'm struggling just now with depression and uh, it's just kind of really bad this week. So, um, I mean, I know you messaged me earlier today to see if I wanted to pull out of this, but nah, let's just do it, you know, because the one thing I've kind of learned about depression and mental illness is that you can't hide away and you can't lock the door and you can't um, pretend it's not happening because then it just lasts longer, you know? So, uh I'm pleased I'm speaking to you. Oh, mate, I, I really, I do appreciate it. It's just when I seen the post last <clears> night, <throat> I was like... Oh, you know, it's that thing where I was like, well, I, well, I tell people this is happening, and I've done it in the past, you know. Um, I made a, a short film with a guy called Cami Tom last year about depression and anxiety and about calling it out. And it was in my mind because for the past two or three weeks, I've felt it, uh, I felt it really coming back. And... I was just thinking about that and I watched it. I, I went and had a look and I watched it and I went, God, you know, I need to listen to my own advice. I need to listen to my own advice and go, I'm not, I'm not right. I'm not right and I need help. And so I, I did go on Facebook last night and go, look, you know what, everybody, um, this is a thing. If I was, if I had the cold or the flu, I would come on here and tell you. So I'm coming on here and telling you I'm fucked. But it's all right because I've, you know, I've seen the doc and it's it's, it's doable and it's sortable because it's been sorted before. Um, and it's been triggered. And I mean, it has been triggered by um, everything that's going on in the world, not just lockdown, but the whole, the whole world's mental just now. It's just, it's just not a comfortable place to be sitting in. And um, I... I it's hard for everybody. Everybody's dealing with it in their own different ways. And I'm so lucky compared to some other people. But at the same time, I need to I need to own whatever is going on with me. And it is um it's rough and it's hard, but I've got help, you know, because I, I I know how to do it. And I've got the root map of getting out of this. I just need to use the I just need to use the tools that I've used before and I know I'll be okay. Yeah, I think it's it's amazing that you would just be open about it, and because I think we all have, we have to. I think everyone is going to be struggling, and just the, all the varying degrees. And I mean, just even at the, the the lesser scale, just it's hard to just be even your your norm pe people that aren't ha normally happy, bubbly. Just everyone's coping mechanisms for from from going to the gym to socialising to. Just everything is just suddenly no longer there. So I think everyone's going to be like, you know, like planning, not being able to have plans to look forward to or holidays to look forward to, or little things like that. So uh, it's true. What um, what worries me is that uh, coming out of this, see, when it was real lockdown, I, I it was okay because there was instructions: stay in the house, and I went fine. So I stayed in the house, and I, you know. I watched Shit's Creek, uh, and, and you know, I found things to do, and I made music. But the uncertainty of of coming back out into the world again, um, and people that have been isolated for this long period of time, has all have been cultivating big mental health problems. And the, I know from experience that the infrastructure isn't there to deal with that. Um, when I first seeked help for depression, I was put on a waiting list for six months for counselling and anything could have happened in those six months, you know? So there is a huge waiting list for any kind of counselling and that I can imagine is just going to be worse when this comes out. And so we need to, so I, I feel a responsibility just from my circle of people 
Mm-hmm. Um, whether it's on Facebook or whether it's people that I know, I, I feel um, not a burden of responsibility, but I feel that I have to go. I'm I'm struggling, you know, yeah. so that a, a few people have contacted me to say, oh, thanks for bringing the subject up because so am I, you know, um, because the worst thing you can do is to just close down from it and pretend it's not happening. Past two, the uh, this week I've been talking about it, but the past two weeks I was pretending it wasn't going on. I was going, I'm just in a downer. I've got the blues. Um, I'm just bored. Nah, it's back and uh, it's a thing. And it's, I, I beat it three years ago. I've not been depression fee for three years. Um, and I've now had to just admit that it's back. And I'm not, I'm not worried. Worried's not the word about it. I just know that I've got it and I know I need to sort it out and I need to deal with it because worrying just makes it worse. And I've got nothing to worry about because I got to see the doctor and I got the proper medication that I know works because it worked last time. And I've got no qualms, no qualms about taking an antidepressant because it worked so well for me last time. And I got off it again easily. Um, that I think people need to have the dialogue and you need to, don't sit in the house and have a nightmare, go and see the doctor or phone is phoning the doctor at the moment because it's a thing and it's a thing that can be sorted. It's a, it's a fuck up that can be sorted. Well, I mean, that is a, uh, it's, it's really good that you, you're aware of that and the antidepressants did work for you in the past. So it's just, in case of, you, you've been out, you've been through the tunnel before and you've got, you've seen the light at the other end. So yeah. You just got. You just need to be strong, and it's really good that you're just doing what you didn't before, because it worked. Well, I tell you what, the first time was worse because I didn't know what it was. So the first time when I had depression, I was scared and frightened because I didn't realise what was happening to me. This time, because I've been through it before, I'm like that. There you go. So. um I don't have the fear attached to it this time. I've just now got a sort of a practical, um, just like if you had the cold, you would go and you would buy paracetamols and Lemsips and, and Lucozade and you know, the Beano and all the stuff that, that you do to make yourself feel better. Um, this time I've got the practical head on going, right, okay, well, what do I need to do? I need to get up and I need to have a shower, first of all, because that that immediately improves things. Uh, and then I need to phone the doc and I need to talk about it. And then I need to be honest about those to those around me because as people are saying, why did you not reply to my text? Why did you not answer the phone? And it's because that stuff's hard. You know, that no, stuff. No, I, I, can only, I, I, I can only imagine what your your uh, whole social media messaging situation must be. You know, so many people, I struggle to, even on a good day, to get to reply to people's messages. And people do take it a bit personally. I think nowadays everyone expects an instant reply it's like there and then, and if you don't reply instantly, people sometimes think that either you're you're in the huff with them or you, <laughs> you're somehow dissing them. And it's just like t- things are busy; you can't reply to every single message. Well, see on my on my fa- for my Facebook, I think I think I pretty much know everybody in my Facebook. Um, I've not got thousands and thousands of people on it. I think I pretty much know everybody, and most of them know that I'm crabbit anyway. I'm a crabbit guy. Um, so if I don't reply, they go, oh, "It's just Tom." And Tom, he'll get he'll get back to me. But um, no, I mean, I, I I'll I'll just chat to folk. It's fine, you know. But uh, Which, I do. I, there aren't a lot of strangers on my Facebook. The other social media platforms are all a bit overwhelming. But Facebook tends to be um, if it's not somebody I know, it's somebody of a friend of a friend. You know that kind of thing. Well, the, the situation I mean, I used to have was uh, as a, a booker and a promoter, and also doing my own band stuff, there's always just lots of messages to catch up on. Mm-hmm. Now, since I've been doing this, obviously you've got to do, you're booking uh, guests weeks in advance sometimes, so there's a constant stream of people trying to arrange dates and stuff like that. And yeah, it's just, it's, it can be quite a lot. It's uh, I, I am not a big fan of it, to be honest, but it's also been really good because I think without having this outlet, it would, it's been good because it means that I've got to go and do something, I've got plans. Otherwise, I'm not sure what I'd do. Probably be, what I would be probably doing is recording more because I finally got a setup in my house to record vocals. I've been recording a bit of music and stuff. Not not anywhere near as productive as you though. You seem to be just firing out uh, songs. That's just insomnia, mate. Mate, honestly, <laughs> listen, Mark. See, the thing is, right? Um, you, I think you're probably similar to me that you you're, you like being busy and you like being creative. So my um. 
my way of getting through a lot of this is to just create all the time. And I've, I've done some writing as well, but mostly I've just been recording. I've been playing with Logic and recording cover versions and then just making a daft video and shoving it up online. And it's keeping me, I'm doing a couple a week and it's just keeping me going. It's just keeping me ticking over for no other reason than just to keep myself busy. And it's stuff that I enjoy doing. And then I, I do my DJ and I do my radio shows at the weekend from the house. And so, like yourself, I... I need to have a structure to the week and I need to have a reason to be doing stuff and I need to keep going. Um, so you're what you're doing every night, this is your wait, this is your thing. You know, this is your thing that you've been doing. Well, it's um, a, to be fair, it's actually the most structure I've actually ever had because normally it's, <laughs> uh, it's always a bit chaotic in the, the live music scene. You're doing it one night, you're not doing it another night. But this is actually like seven o'clock every night. I've got something. So I, I do actually, I'm more structured than I would normally be, to be perfectly Aye. honest. Aye. But it's, so is that what, what would you if look if it look if everything went back to sort of what what we deem normality? What would you what do you miss? What would you like to just do that you can't Gig. do right now? Gigging yeah. um, for the I mean I I, I was DJing in Club Tropicana um, oh, yeah. and and also a club in Dundee called Duck Slatteries, which is like a, a more of a, a performance venue. So. We ran a big variety show every Saturday night, which had dancers and it had video projection, and it was a little, a little bit. Like, uh, and we have Bongos Bingo in as well. They come in and do stuff, um, and it was a big show. And I had that every week, and that took up, up about four days a week for me of preparing that, editing it all together, and then going up and doing the show. And that was really, really pumping my stuff. I was, I had kind of decided I wanted to do that rather than acting. Uh, uh, towards yeah. the end, I was going, do you know, I'm liking this more. I'm enjoying this, and and so that's what I'm missing the most because that's the thing that was that was keeping me busy just before lockdown happened, and the place was really thriving, and we will again, you know. But it's just it's just the that's what I miss. I miss performing, and I miss jumping about being a maddie and and singing and playing my piano and and all that, um, and doing it in my hallway isn't the same. But it, <laughs> it's because uh, I've only got two cat. I've only got two cats as an audience, and they well, hate me. Yeah. Well, your cats are, uh, uh, John Suter's saying, can I take my eyes off the cat, by the way? But your music, Tom Urey, has made lockdown. Yeah, it, it appears every so often. Your music has made a better place for me, at least. Uh, shout oh, to Sophie. John, mate. Thank you. My cat is a fat bastard, by the way. Come here. <laughs> okay. okay, come here. No, not interested. No, cat, not cats don't, cats. Do you know the cats are annoyed that I'm in their house? Because normally I'm, I'm never here. And they're like, what the fuck are you doing? And what, what, when are you going to go out? It's, I, I've uh, I had I had two cats as well growing up, so I know the the feeling. They just they they, they, they just weren't fed, really, didn't they? They just sit there like that. <laughs> Where's the dreamies, mate? You make, me want, you make me want to smoke because this is a I would like to because you don't you you quit smoking about was that eighteen years ago or something? Nineteen ninety eight, twenty two years ago. 22 years ago, man. Yeah. I've been I've been trying to, I think it was about two years ago, I tried to quit smoking for the first time. And I've been doing quite well with lockdown, which definitely made it a lot easier for me. I think I smoked like 16 times since January, which is good wow. for someone who's a heavy smoker. But it's, it was, it was uh, I had a really good record of eight times, smoking eight times in about four months. And then it's went up to about 16 times now. Uh, since lockdown began, and I'm just, um, I, I've not quite beaten it yet. Well, Any I tell you, uh, well, okay, I've given up smoking, alcohol, and fish suppers and meat. Right? Smoking's the hardest thing I ever stopped. It's the hardest. I've not had one since 1998, March the 9th, 1998. I remember. I remember the exact moment. And every day, every day, without fail, I go, oh, every day, at least three, four times a day, I'll go, I'll sit down and I'll have a cigarette. Ah, oh, shit, I don't smoke anymore. I miss it. Do you know what? I don't crave it anymore. I don't have that. You know that, oh my God, I need a cigarette. I don't have that anymore. That goes, that goes after about three months. But see that feeling of being at one with the universe that you get when you've got a packet of cigarettes and you you go, ah, and that camaraderie you get with other people that have got, that you know, that go out for us, and they're all like, oh, do you want, do you want one of mine? Do you want one? Yeah. That all goes, you know, and so if you give up, and you must give up because it's horrendous, 
Yeah. It's fucking horrendous, right? Um, you might always want one for the rest of your life. See if there was a nuclear bomb coming and we had four minutes to live and there was a pint of lager, a whisper, and <laughs> a cigarette, I would just be like, <sighs> the one what? thing I'm a... The, 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 I've actually, I thought, there's been a few times where I've thought I've definitely beaten it, you know, I went five weeks without smoking and then I'll just end up having, I can I can not smoke by having a beer, but I just maybe have that one beer too much and then I have a cigarette and then just like you're talking about that one with the universe thing, I did that on Monday, I had a day off on Monday and I was out in the countryside and I wasn't even drinking, but I still had that cigarette just because that oneness you're talking about wait i feel it's really happy the... this this is a beautiful bit of scotland i'm going to celebrate by having a cigarette which is the most stupid thing ever but obviously that's because i smoked at the weekend so i've, I've went back to square one a little bit well you've not because you've not had one today have you have you i had one today ah oh, mark mate come I on had, i had one today do you know what know. to do just put them in the bin get rid of them put them in the bin get them get them to fuck I don't know why I lied to you, Tom. Tell you what, stop, smoking. stop smoking right now, live on air. Stop smoking now, and then you've got a record of the time that you said, I no longer smoke. And then in 20 years' time, you can say, do you know, I stopped smoking <laughs> live on the internet, and here's the I, evidence. I remember the day, the time, I was talking to Tom. Aye. Yeah. Okay, we'll try. I'll try not to smoke for the rest of this show, at least. You now want I, one, I, don't you? I want one yeah, now. Well, let's, well, let's, just, let's just change the, let's change the subject then. So you think quitting drinking? So so that same. Did you, I think it quitting drinking and smoking was that was that the same time? Hey, uh, no, I oh, wow, right. So I stopped smoking in nineteen ninety eight, and then I stopped drinking in two thousand and one. All right, so there was that three three years of drinking and no. Oh yeah, uh, as soon as that I stopped was... smoke, as soon as I stopped smoking, I had a spare hand, so <laughs> another drink appeared in it. <laughs> so it just got it got worse. So I. Uh, I, uh, 2001, I stopped drinking as well. Uh, I mean, it's, it's obviously, it's difficult when you're in the, you know, you're playing live gigs and you're surrounded by people drinking and smoking. It's not, I mean, it's it's easy enough to quit. Well, it's not easy, but it's easier to quit drinking and smoking if you're not going out socialising and going to gatherings. But it's also that, that uh, you know, when you get that adrenaline buzz from playing a gig, that's when I've I can that's when I sometimes ruin it. Just yeah. when I come off stage. Just that moment Listen, I come off stage. The I get adrenaline's it. kicked in and I'm just yeah, going, absolutely. Oh, I'll, tell, I'll tell you what I don't actually enjoy anymore. That's the only one I actually enjoy. Well, what I what I did in early sobriety, um I got got around about two thousand and I'm checking my wall, I've got a poster. Two thousand and six, which was when I was about five years sober. I got a part in the stage version of Tutti Frutti, which uh, I don't know if you, maybe you're too young. It was a, a big TV show in the 80s, a John Byrne TV show, the Stan Robbie Train. And I got the I got the lead part in that uh, for the National Theatre of Scotland. And uh, it was it was it was brilliant. It was just the, the buzz of doing that show and with a big live band on stage. Um, a lot of really well-known actors in it, and I wasn't at the time at all. You know, I had I basically bulged my way into the auditions, um, and uh, we we toured for a year with that two different uh, versions of it, and it rehearsed in Aberdeen and it played in Aberdeen for three weeks, and every night after the show, which ended on a huge high, everybody went to the pub. And I was left on my own going, what am I going to do? What am I going to do with this heat that's bursting? I want to party. I want to celebrate. So every night, uh, luckily it was the summer, every night I went, I drove along to the kind of quiet bit of the Aberdeen beach. I mean, I probably, maybe would I get murdered. But I drove along there and I would, I would take my shoes and socks off and paddle at like midnight <laughs> and just chill. And then I would sit in the seawall and I would stay there for about an hour, an hour and a half, Quiet in my mind, chill out, and then go back to the digs, and I'd be fine, you know. So I've learned that if I come off stage with a huge high, I'm getting much better at it nowadays. If I come off with a huge uh, with a huge high, uh, norm normally my shows are in Dundee these days, so I've got the drive home. So I get in the car and I put on a podcast, or I put on classical music, or I just have no music and have the windows open, and the drive home is the thing that quietens me down. So. 
I learned over time how to uh, bring myself down from that high because you've got to get that high if you're performing. You can't fake it. So uh, I'm better at it nowadays, but it is tough. It is tough to 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 do all that, and when you've just stopped drinking, and everybody's for for a start, everybody's trying to get you to drink. But everybody knows better than to try and get me to drink nowadays because they get their face bitten off. <laughs> yeah, but I suppose you, it's, it's, I suppose it's not so much. I mean, it, that's a shite move from someone who's a friend of yours that knows that you don't drink. But the people that that maybe don't know you, or they maybe just know you as an actor. And they're just, or they're just or as a singer, and they've enjoyed your show, and they just, you know what? They don't know the, the score, and they maybe just offer to buy you a pint. I'm usually out the door and in the car before. Um, <laughs> I, um, I know it's it's, if, it's fine if folk offer to buy me a drink. I go, nah, I'm alright. You know, you get you get better at it, and I don't I don't tend to go and um, if I finished a show with people, I don't tend to go to the bar with them, and they all know because I'm upfront with people. I say, look, I can't drink. I don't drink. Um, and pubs make me a bit uncomfortable, so I'll I'll have a coffee with you tomorrow when we come in. And drunk people and drunk people are annoying when you're sober. Yeah, you end up just feeling half an hour later. You feel like you're in the middle of a smash advert. Remember the smash advert with the aliens? Yeah. <laughs> you, you're just ah, oh, I can't. I'm not speaking the same language as everybody else, so uh, it's not fun for me to to go and and I'll go. You know, I'll go for one. I'll go for a an orange juice and then I'll disappear. I'll sneak out, and my pals all know. They all know that I sneak away from things. And people tend not to invite me to things because they know that I'll just go, oh, no, I've got to go to this thing. So a few weddings of really close pals, they phoned me up and went, will we bother sending you an invitation? And I'm like, no, don't waste the cardboard. You're all right. It's good you mentioned Dundee. Dundee's been a quite... quite a, a, lots of people from Dundee with Jamini, who was on the show last night from Dundee. with Mark Richardson from Dundee Poet. with Gary Robertson from the Cundies as well. And it's just a, sort of quite a, a really important cultural scene. And Dundee, is, is it Dundee you're originally from? No, I'm from Paisley, but um, I, 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 oh God, you know, I, I've developed this tie with Dundee and it came from, um, I've done three pantos up there. Now I'm not, I'm not a panto fan, right? I'm just not, I, I, I'm not into it. But, I, I, there was this company that offered me a, a, a job with them and, and it sounded like a laugh and it was, it was great. And um, it was in Dundee. And uh, one of the main things was that uh, I was able to suggest who could be in the show as well. So I suggested Darren Connell, who I know you've had on. Yes. So Because I think he's a genius. He's a comedy genius, right? So Darren came. Just the idea of Darren Connell in a pantomime is good enough for me. Look, I, I, I wish I could describe, to, right, I'll try and describe it, right? So we've done three together now in Dundee. The past three years, me and Darren have done this pantomime in Dundee, right? Now, Darren, it's like working with Andy Kaufman, right? It is like, so we go on stage and there's a script there, right? There is a script and it's, we're strict, we're strict with the script and everything. But Darren does this thing, right, where... And we got quite a we, we got quite a psychic kind of connection where I knew he was about to do it, and I would pause to let him do it. You know, he would go off at a tangent. So uh, let's say last year it was Cinderella, and me and Darren were the ugly sisters, right? And we're on stage, right? And we're really, really, really glake at ugly sisters, right? Started dad, we've done our own makeup. It's brutal, right? <laughs> and we're standing there and we're arguing about, about an invitation to the ball or something. And then suddenly Darren will just turn around to the go to the audience and go, How 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 am I in a panto? How am I in a panto? I'm a time served bricky. I'm a bricky. How what what am I wearing? How am I here? I did driveways. Does anybody need their driveway done? <laughs> Mate I, I'm trapped in this panto, they'll not let me out. Mate, mate, can I come and live in your shed? <laughs> and sometimes, there was one, the record was, because the, the stage manager used to time the shows every night, the record one night was we went 21 minutes over because Darren had, <laughs> and had went off on something and the audiences just fall to pieces laughing. And so, the, I mean, I, could, I have to go and sit down. 
You know, I, I think one time I went and just sat in the audience, dressed up, just to watch. <laughs> he is a genius. He's an improvisational, improvisational genius as well. But he was really good at if something worked one night, we, he could keep it in for the next night and make it look as if it had happened off the cuff. So that was the big uh, attraction with that was Darren has got this controlled um, chaos that he brings on stage. And that's what makes him such a kind of exciting stand up. And then Panto, I wish he was doing a big Panto in Glasgow so folk could see what I, what he does because he's just, the kids love him, right? Because he plays it like a big kid, but the adults love they're just it's just so I had three years of that and then um I ended up working with the company that won Club Tropicana and they have this venue called Duck Slatteries in Dundee and I was involved with that right from the start and I ended up kind of helping to put together all the stuff for it as well. So I'm in Dundee more than I'm in Glasgow in the real world and I really love the place. It's got a um it's very like Glasgow. The people are very like Glasgow. They're, they're, they've got the same humour. I don't know whether it's because it's a port or because it's by a river, but they've got the same humour and they've got the same vibrant music scene. Um, and a lot of art has come from there. And I, I just I just enjoy it. I like it. And they've got a 24-hour bakery. Yeah, that is true. Clarkies. Clarkies. Yep. Absolutely. Now, obviously, nowadays, in the days of Greg's taking over the world, there is yeah. a few 24 hours, but this they were doing it long before. Long, they sell long, it, long and before. they sell every food. It's mm -hmm. good. That is good. It's good. Better than a Greg's. Good. Better than a Greg's. So do you think we're doing something like pantomime? Because you know you were you were saying how you were starting to get more into your music again, rather than acting. Is it because you get that? I would imagine pantomime is a bit more like playing live music because you're getting that instant response. Nah, I mean, I've not done, the, I've not done much the, acting myself. I've done a couple. I do. I do some comedy skits here and there. But I suppose that it, getting that instant reaction from an audience is is um, going to be quite a nice feeling compared to doing something on film and you don't really find out. Probably if, in, a, in the case of a film, months later before you get any feedback from it. That's true. That's true. They're totally different things. They're totally different yeah. things. The, theater and, and telefilm, film, they're, they're, they're just completely different. It's like two different careers. Um, the 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 theater stuff, I I I struggle with repetition and I struggle with uh, long things. So I'm okay for a week in a stage show. After that, I just start going, oh, can I, I can't do this. So television and film for me, I much prefer doing that. Um, it, just, it just feels, it's a different craft. It's a very different way of doing things. And it, it's... I'm, I'm into it. I love movies and I love TV. Um, I've always preferred, I've, I've never been mad about the theatre, uh, which is a terrible, terrible, terrible thing for an actor to say, but I don't really go to it. As there's a lot of times I sit baffled. You know, my mates will go, oh, we're going to go and see this play, thing was in it. And I go, oh, okay. And I go along and I sit down and somebody will come on stage and start talking about something and then somebody else will come on. And then within five minutes, I'm lost. I don't, I, I don't know what I'm missing. But I can't uh, suspend my disbelief very easily. And then usually I don't know what anybody's talking about or where they are or what they're doing. And then we, it comes to the end and what, what did you think? And I go, oh, it was, oh, oh, it was good. I liked it. It was good. The new, the new season of Curb Your Enthusiasm. I think it's about, I'm a bit happy yes. to do it. And yes. there's Larry David. He tries to give the guy some good feedback, but it's not good enough. And uh, he's an actor. He's like... It's pretty crazy the idea of anyone wanting to do a one man show. It's sort of that whole idea. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, I know I never know what to say. So uh, if somebody, so I'll use my excuse of, oh, I, I, I don't drink, so I'm away up the road, so I don't have to say, oh, I really enjoyed. I slept through a lot of plays as well. I'm a terrible, terrible <laughs> human being. I'm a terrible actor. It's bad. Uh, so no, the telling, telling film. Were you, and hey, carry were you on. Doing when you're doing stage stuff, is it like you said about after about a week? Is that usually about the time it takes? So maybe like four days in, that's when you start being your best because all the, the the words are locked down in your head. You've tried a few different ways, so you know exactly what you're doing, and then you hit a point where it's like after you've peaked, it just you feel like you're just repeating the same thing, even though it's sort, a new audience. Sort of. I, I like. How can I explain it? Right. So, 
And I quite like, I've done quite a lot of work in the or and more of the play a pie and a pint. I don't know if you've ever yeah. seen any of them. I've done about six or seven of them. And that sort of suits my attention span because you rehearse for two weeks and then you do the show for a week. And it's terrifying because, you know, it's there's not a lot of rehearsal time and, and the, but it feels like you've, you, it feels like you're producing a thing and there it is. When you do a long running show, um, and and I'm I'm alone in this really. All, all my pals love doing all this kind of stuff, but I, after a while, I get oh, I can't listen to that song again, or oh no, I can't. I, I, and and things start to drive me mad. So I th the pants will be doing Dundee's okay because it's about a three four week run, so that's manageable and it's fine and it's fun and it's always great people and it's a good company to work for and it, and it just feels good. Um, but there's a couple of ones I've done that, that were still going towards the end of January and you're sitting there and everybody's back at school and everybody's back at work and you're sitting there in a damp costume you've been wearing since November and it's like, yeah, I can't believe I'm, can't believe I'm still singing that so <laughs> song like two and a half months <laughs> later. So I'm, I admire anybody that can do it. I don't think I'm cut out for it. Um, and I, it, it's a kind of scary thing to admit because... Somebody might be watching this going, oh, don't we get him to do that. Oh, no, he says he's not cut out for it. So it's kind of, but I, I'm just honest about it. And the older you get, you go, you know what? I don't think I want to do that anymore. It sounds, like, it love... sounds, like, it sounds like working in a call center when you've got to read the same script over and over again. But I suppose it, the, the job gets easier if you've got Darren Connell sitting in a booth next to you. Oh, well, it's never the same twice. If you do the show with Darren, it's never the same twice. It's, you know, I wonder what he's going to do this time. And sometimes he'll come up to me in the wings and go, I'm going to do this. And I go, oh, my God. And then I, it's just genius. It's just utter genius. And everybody, I mean, any, if you ask anybody that has been in panto with Darren, they will just say, oh, it's the best. It's just the best. He's so, so funny. And everybody's yeah. desperate for him to 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 just do his thing, and he's good at getting it back. He reins it back into the script, so it never it never messes up anything technically. But he just, I, I just hope, I hope that Darren gets an opportunity for people to see him doing it. Yeah. Well, it's well, hopefully, well, in fact, probably it might be. They might need to stream the pantomime this year. Who knows? Oh, what's yeah. going on? God, who knows what's going to happen? <laughs> who knows? Who knows? You know, cheating themselves. Um, I think it's it's quite freeing to just admit that you don't know what's going on. Because for the first couple of months of lockdown, I was trying to trying to grasp everything and try to predict things. But it's quite freeing just to go right. I don't actually have a clue what's going on anymore. Well, that's you know that. that that's what I think we need to just be like that because nobody has got a clue what's going on. Politicians don't have a clue what's going on. Nicola's good at that. Nicola's good at going, I don't know. It's a virus. Don't know. It's, I don't know the answer to that because it's a virus. Whereas you get other politicians that are like, oh, yes, well, we've done this, we've done that. Like that. Nobody knows. Nobody knows what it is, what it's going to do to us, when we're going to be able to do a thing. I just try and get to the end of the day without losing my head. Um, I just think it's a, I just think it's a scary time. And, and, I, I kind of thought about, you know, I, I was talking about depression. I was, I was kind of thinking, God, is it? Should I, you know, should I talk about this when there's so many people are, are really, really in a bad place? And I'm like, well, yeah, because I genuinely think that when this, when this lockdown properly lifts, we're going to have a lot of work to do in in mental health. We're going to have a lot of work to do about convincing people to go. I'm not well. We're going to, we're going to, and, and if that system is still a six month waiting list for counselling and a six month waiting list for help, that's, that's wrong. And that needs to be urgently dealt with, um, just as much as, as other things have been urgently dealt with. The mental health of people has got to be prioritised because it's, Everything's just strange when you're you're going to people start going out and you can't just give someone a hug. So it's that sort of the I seen that there was a, there was a, a, an old woman in the supermarket they calling it the the COVID shuffle. You know that um, the thing that everyone does. Now. Get back for me. Get back. <laughs> I mean, I've only uh, I mean, I, I've only I've not been to the supermarket. I went into B and Q the other day 
because I decided I was going to paint my house because I don't know if you can see, but it's scabby, right? So I thought, I'll go to B&Q. Surely it'll be fine. And I went in and I, I lasted 20 seconds before I just came back out again because I was like, no, somebody, somebody uh, brushed past me. Nobody had any face coverings on. It just was. It just looked like I, I just went. Oh no, no! I'll just. I'll have a scabby house and 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 stay alive. <laughs> um, but I've got, I had anxiety with that, and I, uh, you know, what the, the what we're going to be facing is because people have been isolated and because people have had um, no contact with people. I mean, I live on my own, so I've had no contact with anybody. I've loads, loads of online contact and loads of pals, and I've met a couple of folk for a walk. But my whole life before this was hanging out with people and going and meeting people in Glasgow for a coffee. Sometimes I would go and meet Darn and would go to Nando's, all that kind of stuff. All, all these things that I, that were a real big important part of my life was talking to people and having a laugh. Having a laugh's my main thing. I need to have a laugh, even if things are awful, I need to find the humour in it. So I need to try and have a laugh about depression as well. <laughs> it's, the, you can't, it's really hard to find something to laugh about, but I don't want to be one of these tears of a clown guys, you know, uh, Robin Williams and, and putting it on for the sake of it. I'm not putting anything on them. I'm actually quite cheerful talking to you tonight, but um, it's just, we're going to be dealing with people emerging from isolation and emerging from what might be some sort of a pressure cooker of um, depression and also what has been going on in households that where there's domestic abuse or child abuse or any of that kind of stuff, people locked in a house together. I think it's going to be a big challenge when this lifts and I think we have to, uh, we have to campaign, I think, to get uh, first aid for people like mental health first aid uh as 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 important as if you'd fallen and broken your leg we need to get i, I mean i would happily train as a first aid responder uh and i think that it needs to be there needs to be a lot of education there needs to be a lot of and it starts with people saying i'm fucked i need help that's where it starts so i'm fucked i need help Absolutely. Maybe I should get a t-shirt saying I'm fucked. I need help. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then on the back, I'm also here to help because yes, you know, whatever, yes, because so everyone's actually. Well, it's like the whole population, pretty much the whole population. I know there's exceptions to the rule. I know there's been key workers and stuff that have um, they're still interacting with people, but a massive percentage of the population, not just in this country but around the world, it's like everyone's just got the jail. <sighs> Well, yeah, I mean, it's not like, it's obviously not like the jail, but um, it, is, it is a huge drastic change in people's circumstances. So you've got, I mean, my, my mother, uh, my mother died a few years ago and she was in a care home for the last five years of her life and she had Alzheimer's. And I have got no idea what would have happened if she was, if that was happening now and we couldn't go and see her. Um, and she was, she had a kind of, uh, the, there's two types of Alzheimer's, the, the, the kind of, um, we'll look at the lovely flowers, and then there's, where am I, what's going on? So she was distressed a lot of the time, and yeah. she walked. She used to walk around the corridors of the care home, and that is a thing. A lot a lot of Alzheimer's sufferers, dementia sufferers, just they just walk the whole time. They wouldn't have been able to keep her in the room, you know? Um, and I think that, there's been people that have been separated from their family who are in care homes that haven't seen them for months. And there's people in care homes that haven't seen their families. This is so sad and it's such a tragedy. And there's going to be repercussions. There's going to be repercussions for people's mental health. And uh, well, that's, that's happening to me right now, Tom. I've got a very close family member who we can't speak to. They're, what they've started to try to do is a, a video call type thing, which, mm -hmm. is, uh, which is just not the same. But I suppose it's, it's interesting that the tech not the, the increasing use of technology. I'd never did a video call in my life before lockdown, and then obviously I'm doing this kind of thing. So it's it's not the same, but I suppose one positive aspect is that we do have the technology at our fingertips, or or people who are privileged enough to have this at their fingertips. Compared yeah. to if this was happening in the late nineties or early two thousands, it'd be a totally different ball game. I know, I know, and the. The contact with people like Zoom, 
you know, um, I've been able to have get togethers with friends on Zoom at nights and it's made me feel um, connected to people. And uh, Janie and Ashley have been doing their live uh the the live video streams every night as well, and they're good mates of mine, Jenny Godley and Ashley Story. And uh, it just uh, did the care the care monger. It was like twelve hours they done yesterday, or Sunday, I think it was. Twelve grand they raised just wow. by sitting on live grand stream. an hour. That's incredible. I know, I know. So I, I've been missing them, and and so at night I can click that on, and the two of them are yep, and then I go and get a coffee, and it feels as if I'm hanging out with them. The technology is fantastic, um, and. I've just, it, it's fine, you know, it's, it's, I, I'm sitting, I feel part, part of, of talking about depression and stuff, I, I feel, and I need to go over it, right? I feel as if, oh, I can't, I can't moan about this because people have got COVID, people have lost people, people, um, people have got cancer and people are from terrible, terrible, terrible people are homeless, but I, I, I can't, I need to just go, well, right. This is this is this is going to be a problem that everybody's going to be having. I thought I'd got over it. I thought it was never coming back. I always thought if this comes back, I'll be able to deal with it. But um, we are going to have a lot of people that are maybe encountering depression for the first time because this situation with this virus and this lockdown has never happened in our lifetimes. Um, so I think a, a knock-on effect of that is people are going to have be like what I was the first time depression arrived. I didn't know what it was. And so that that added to the the incapacity of it. Um so I, I think that what we need that there needs to now be and we need to start now before this lifts, we need to start encouraging people to put their hands up and go, I need help. I'm fucked. I need help. That's yeah. the that's the slogan we've arrived at Mark. The that's the slogan. When you get uh, I'm fucked, I need help. And let's have a wee look at the comments. Uh, we've got Sharon says you're looking amazing, Tom. Oh, Sharon, thanks. Uh, Petra says theater becomes Groundhog Day. Yes, Petra. <laughs> uh, Cameron says Duck Slattery's and Dundee is mental in a good way. It is. Uh, Alan says this is going to have a massive effect on people's mental health. Very well said, Tom. Oh, thanks, Alan. Uh, Angela, my mother had Alzheimer's is, is really hard, so I can't imagine what it'd be like if she was here living through the pandemic. It's really difficult from my, my perspective. It's a, a very tough situation. Uh, Alan also remembers the Tutti Frutti when it was on the TV. Yeah, that was great. I remember, do you know, I was 17 when it was on. It was in 1986, I think. And um, it was the first time that I had seen a bigger guy that looked a bit like me in a lead role. It was it was Robbie Coltrane singing and and doing a comedy TV thing, and 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 I just kind of went, ah, oh, I want to do that. That's who I want to be. I want to do that. And then uh, I mean, all these years later, I ended up getting the part, and it was it was a big cast full of uh, real pros and some well known people. And that was, I mean, who was in it? Who was in that show? It was me and my girlfriend was Don Steele. She played Susie Kettles. And Tam Dean Byrne was in it. Uh, Gavin Mitchell was in it. Probably Gavin not. Mitchell, Bobby we've the Barman. We've had Gavin on the show as well. Gavin, what a sweetheart. He was on it. He was in it. What a riot we had. Um, there was loads of other actors in it as well. And it was just, it was a, it was a huge baptism of fire for me as well because I hadn't really done a big giant professional theatre show like that and it was the it was one of there was two launch shows for the National Theatre of Scotland one was Black Watch and one was Tutti Frutti and they launched at the same time so there was a huge amount of press coverage over it and there's this legend which is true I am um, they made a documentary about it and they talked about this story and it is true I can't deny it I found out that this show was happening and uh, couldn't get an audition. I couldn't get an audition for the part because it was the National Theatre of Scotland. I hadn't been to drama school. I had done bits and bobs of comedy on TV. I hadn't really done an awful lot of theatre. And there was me trying to get an audition for this big high prestige launch for the National Theatre of Scotland. 
And I got my agent at the time, who was the comedy unit, the comedy unit were my agent, the people that made uh, Still Game and Chewing the Fat. And they phoned the National Theatre and said, look, he's really right for this part. Would you not see him? And they said, look, we've got somebody in mind for it already. Um, Thanks, but no thanks. But I just was like, no, not having it. I need to get seen. I wasn't even, I need this part. I just went, I I can't let this chance go by. So I phoned them and I said, look, can you give me 15 minutes? Please just give me 15 minutes to come in and see you. And they were, they were laughing and they were nice and they were going, look, really, no, it's, we've, we've looked at your CV. It's not for us. Thank you for your energy. So I went, well, do you know what? I'm going to phone you every day. And they went, well, that's fine. You do that. Right. So I phoned them every day. Um, I went, hi, it's Tom. And they're like, oh, it's Tom. Hi, Anne. How are you today? I'm, I'm fine. Can I get an audition? No. Okay, fine. <laughs> I'll, phone you, I'll phone you tomorrow. Thanks very much. So um, it went on for, I think I think it was about three weeks. People have got different stories, but I think it was three weeks that I phoned. And uh, eventually, one day when I phoned, they went, right, the director's in on Friday. If you come in at quarter to five, on Friday afternoon, he'll have a coffee with you if it will stop you phoning us. And I said, okay, right, that's fine. So I, I got into Glasgow, I got on a black suit, I gelled my hair up into a quiff, I took my guitar and I, went in and I met them. And uh, I met the director and he said, uh, so you've not got a lot of theatre on your CV. And I said, I know that, but I think I can do this. And he said, well, we've actually got somebody else in mind and we're, the offer's about to go out. And I went, right, well, all I'm asking is that you let me have a chance to audition for you. And he went, okay, fine, fair enough. So he went away and printed off a scene and handed me the script. And we did the scene. And then he said, right, okay, thanks. And I said, can I sing you a song? Because it was a musical. And he went, oh, that wouldn't be necessary. And I said, look, I brought my guitar. Let me sing a song. <laughs> And he went, right, fine. So I got the guitar out and I sang Love Hearts, which is from the show. And uh, he said, right, well, thanks for coming in. Thank you. Uh, And then when I was leaving, I said, thanks, everybody. And they're all going, okay, see you later. So I went back home and I put it out of my head because I thought, well, I've done it. I I got in and I did it. I got the part. I got it. They phoned me me a week later and went, right, you, you, you nailed it. So I persistence basically banging the door in going please see me please see me please see me and I ended up getting this part that changed my life because through uh through doing that part I got a London agent so uh the when there's a big show like that the London agents all come and see it and uh one of the uh one of the agents came up to me afterwards and said do you have representation then at that point I didn't and I said, no, they said, well, we'd like to represent you. Um, well, we don't mind you living in Glasgow, but uh, we, we, we think that we could. So um, I've been with them ever since, and they've been fantastic for me. You know, they've been absolutely brilliant. They got me all the, the River City and uh, train spot and all that kind of stuff all came from that, came from me banging that door down and insisting that I get the audition. That's incredible. And I think that you, you're doing the song with the... F- would have made all the difference as well because you've got an incredible voice, man, and uh, oh, some musician nice, and stuff mate. as well. But I think that's, I think probably by doing that wee extra bit. But why, why, what are you so, what made you so determined and so confident and so determined that I, this is my part? Is it just, did you just know that that was, this was your big chance? I knew, I knew I, could, I, knew the part? I knew I could do it. I understood the character and I understood and I loved the show and I loved the writing. It was written by John Byrne who is from Paisley like me. He grew up in the same street that my grandfather grew up in. We had the same rhythm of speaking. I knew that I spoke in the rhythm he was writing in. It all fitted and it all worked. And I was going, this this is the role that, you know, this is the role that I would dream of playing. And I can't believe they're doing a stage version of it. If I don't do everything in my power to try and make this happen, then I'll regret it for the rest of my life. So that is why I just went hell for leather with it. And then um, working on the show was an absolute joy, an absolute joy, because John Byrne, the author, was in the rehearsal room with a typewriter. And he's like, do you know who I mean by John Byrne? Do you know who I mean? Yeah, well, I was actually, I applied for the John Byrne Award. Did you? 
Yeah, because yeah. like I've I've not I never one of the things is I've never applied for funding or uh-huh. competitions or anything. And it was one of my New Year's resolutions, like fill out forms and apply for things because I think there's a a lot of artists it's quite easy to just fall into the trap of oh it's a secret society, they just look after their friends. But if you don't apply yourself, if you don't literally apply yourself, then you can't really be safe. Do you know, it can, be, it can be like that, Mark. It can be a bit of a closed shop. Um, and sometimes you need to bash the door down. And that's, well, that's what, what, well, that's what I did with festivals. You know, I, I, music festivals is my favourite thing to go to. And I wanted my band mm. to play music festivals. And I, I worked really hard at finding ways in to the festival circuit. And you tend, what, like exact same, I'm sure it is for the same for everything else. Once you're accepted by one and you appear on one flyer, that kind of sort of gives you a it's, stamp it's, of approval and then everyone it's else is you. happy to get would consider you. Aye, it's it's being seen in something that will lead to something else. And uh, luckily for me, this show Tutti Frutti was a big deal um, and it toured and, and a lot of people saw it. So when River City happened, they knew who I was. So they they kind of, I had I had the... The credentials of having done something that was good quality. So, so you said there was just a couple of bits of bits of you said you'd done just bits of comedy here and there. What what was that? that you were doing well, it was you? well, right. Uh, well, the first thing I'd done was chewing the fat. Um, and how that, did you get? How did you get into chewing the fat? I'm I, I'm really good pals with Karen Dunbar, right? Um, absolute genius. Absolute. Genius, right? So Karen and I were pals before she ever did Chewing the Fat. And a she did the first series of it and they they did a second series and then they decided to do a stage show version of it in the Citizens Theatre. So they wanted to do at the end of the uh at the end of the show, they wanted to do a panto end and they wanted to do bring down the clue and do a song sheet. Uh singing His Majesty's Home for the Blind. And uh, they were saying, oh, well, we should get a piano player. And Karen went, my pal, Tom, plays the piano. Can you get him? So they said, I just get him in. So I arrived in to play the piano at the end, but they thought it would be funny because it was Jack and Victor at the end. They thought it would be funny if I was in a dress playing an old woman, playing the piano. So they gave me a couple of lines and it was this old woman. And it was basically Isa. <laughs> it's not the first time eyes has appeared. So I get in there, and uh, the, the, you know it was before take it was before chewing the fat had really taken off. So it was in a, a budget. So the, the the stage manager, a woman called Mary Devlin, said, "Look, would you mind helping out stage hand as well?" So I went, "Yeah." So I ended up involved in the whole show, and then in another couple of sketches. And then it transferred to the Kings the year after when Chewing the Fat really took off. So I was in that as well. And uh, Ford and Greg and Karen said, look, just come and be in the TV version as well because there's loads of sketches where we need an extra person. We've got Mark and Paul, uh, but we need, you know. So Series 3 of Chewing the Fat, I pop up in about every, what, about once an episode I pop up, like the, uh, the Ronald Villiers quick fit, Advert. <laughs> I love Ron Williams. He was my favorite, was, I think. That was my first one, Finty Tin. That was the first TV thing I did. Um, other things. So I ended up in Chewing the Fat. And through that, uh, the comedy unit who made Chewing the Fat, Colin Gilbert and April Chamberlain, asked me if they wanted, because I didn't have an agent. They said, well, we'll, we'll act as your agent. So uh, I thought, great. Would they come and pump? Would they come and pump? <laughs> oh, would they come and pump? So uh, through that, I uh, I got into Jonathan Watson was starting a radio show called Watson's Wind Up that was produced by Philip Differ. So they asked if I fancied doing that on the radio with them as well. And so I was like, I although I don't know anything about football, nothing, not a thing, right? So through that, I ended up doing only an excuse. So I did only an excuse for four years, and it was really good parts I was getting in that. I was Tam Cowan in that, and <laughs> uh, a few few other people. Uh, but I had to have every joke explained to me because I don't know anything about football at all. But that was that was great. And then uh, when Chewing the Fat came to an end, Karen got her own spin-off show called The Karen and Bar Show. And I got a decent chunk in that. So I, I, I got loads and loads of sketches in there. We did this 
music duo called Almost Angelic, uh, where we were, it was kind of like Glasgow cabaret singers, and Karen would sing like, who let the dogs out? And I'd go, woof, woof, woof. woof, woof. Um, and that kind of took off, and, and, and that we did four series of that. So that was a real training ground for him. It was a real TV training ground, um, just learning about disciplines of acting on telly which is a lot harder than it looks and i still never mastered it <laughs> just mentioning all my favorite shows at that time it was i loved tune the fat i loved yeah. when excuse back then as well uh, and then uh, and I, as i said Cam dunbar is an absolute genius I've, yeah i'm used to working with musicians a lot so i don't i, I, I don't usually do the can i get a photo thing because it's quite you know it feels embarrassing at times but i seen i met karen dunbar at a ted talk backstage and i asked for the photo for her because it was a wee bit sta stage struck. It's actually, it's Karen Dunbar, no way. And then, it's so all from, from Tune the Fat, Karen Dunbar, and then obviously still gaming. You're talking about that song, um, what was that, Her Royal Majesty's Home for the Blind? Her Majesty's Home for the Blind. Well, yeah, that, that get, I, I was at Still Gaming. I, I took my dad to the show, uh, the, the last Still Game show, uh, and that song reappeared. It did, because I, I, I was the music director for that show. So all the music you heard in that show, I co-wrote and produced. So um, there was the uh, the song about being dead. There was the sitting your ass, Bobby. And then there was the the Bobby song that Karen sung at the end. B is for the Bobby that I love so much. So I, I co-wrote that with Ford and Greg and uh, I produced all the music. So that was a, that was a six to seven week period of work last year working with them all again which it's lovely because i've done every, all three hydro shows i've done all the music for so they keep using the good thing about ford and greg is they keep using the same people so it's like a it's like a family it's like a a, a circus troupe that get back together every few years um so last year's was the biggest one because there was songs all the way through it and i had to compose and produce all the music for that all the backing tracks and then work with the cast get all the singing going, get all the harmonies. My favourite was Matt Costello that played Stevie the Bookie as Satan, yeah. singing, uh, God, what was it he sang? I can't remember the name of the song, but we wrote this song for him, and he just, um, you're a miserable bastard, Tam Mullen was the name of the song. <laughs> and it had Tam on a spinning wheel with somebody throwing knives that I was mental. And then yeah, that... The real... values were great for it. Oh man. See, see, being able to get... They, they basically just said to me, right, look, You've got a two-hour show at the Hydro to do all the music for. Here's a bunch of lyrics and a tune. Go for your life. So I got this big blank canvas of the Glasgow Hydro to make a show, to, to do the music for. And I was in the rehearsal room the whole time, so I was there for the whole. And it was so hard to keep the secret that Karen was in it because she was the big reveal at the end. She played God as Betty. Um, so <laughs> that secret. And uh, it just was a total, total buzz. And to go into the hydro and sit and watch that show happen on a massive scale to stuff that I'd recorded and sitting here in the hall. With my how, key many, how many people were actually tuned in and how many people actually came to the hydro over that period? I couldn't answer you that, but it must be, it was like, it's a 14,000 capacity. 14, and I think it was a day and you're doing two shows a day. Well, no, no, they did one show a day. Um, they didn't, they didn't rip the arse out of it. I think they did two shows at the weekend. But um, the first time, I mean, the first time we did the, the the first show where I had written this song about Isa getting stoned on mushroom soup. Um, Utjad bastard, Utjad bastard, Utjad bastard box. And I, had been, I hadn't been in rehearsals a lot for that. I'd recorded it in the house and then went in and got them to record the vocals and then left them to it. And so I didn't go and see that show until about two weeks into it. And I went with Susie McCabe. Do you know Susie McCabe? Comedian. Yes, yeah. Well, I don't know her personally, but I'm a fan of her work. You need to get Susie on. Get Susie yeah. on. She's brilliant. Me and Susie went to see it, right? And we were sitting there, and I had no idea how massive it was going to be. The Klansman vanished, and it turned into this. And I just sat there going, ah, oh, song I've written is on in a huge arena. I can't believe this. I can't believe it. And uh, so the next show, the second show they did was they'd won a cruise, and it was like a carry-on film. And then the, the third show, because it was so surreal, and because they died and they went to heaven, I got to do all sorts of weird shit with the music. So um, that was thrilling. It was really, really hard, and it was really hard work. And my, you know, the stress was bad. But the end result, it just felt like 
it just was a good ending to it. You know, they won't do it again. They they won't do it again. Um, but it felt like a good. There you go. That's it. That was incredible. It was really yeah. good to go. I'm going yeah. to read Peter Gavin's question out because he's he's asked me a couple of times. Right, Tom was almost angelic based on Robert and May. No. Absolutely not. It wasn't, and I'll tell you for why. Um, Robert and May are actually really, really good pals of mine and Karen's. Um, and when you look at what Robert and May do, it's really, really clever, and they're really they're pros. And it is uh, Robert's a musical genius, and May is not only one of the funniest people I've ever met, but she's a great actress, right? Because I worked with her this year. Almost Angelic were based on two people. One of them was, a, oh God, he's dead now, so it doesn't matter, a keyboard teacher I once had that was miserable, right? And Karen based the Angela character on a woman who we had met at several charity functions in the 90s who was, who was exactly like what Karen was doing because... The character Karen played in Almost Angelic was quite kind of, hey, how you doing? Whereas May is a total comedian, you know, and a total down with it, you know, and there's no airs or graces. She's like, uh, you know. So the fact that it's a woman standing singing and a man in the keyboard led people to think it was Robert and May, but it never crossed our mind that it was Robert and May. And I still love Robert and May to this day. I think what they do is brilliant. And they've actually invited me around to their garden for coffee, but as soon as I can go out there, the house, but no, it's not based on Robert and me at all. And I know they get a lot, but do you know what? They they like it as well. They're fans of it. They came and saw us live and stuff, and thought we're going. Uh, Robert, is it Robert May? Because I'm the audience, and we're going. No, it's, no. <laughs> was it was almost angelic? Did, am I right in saying that the the glasses of Mad Dog 2020? Did they? Did they? In one of this, it was. I just remember a. See, like, there was, a, there was not a skip where it was just like they were all just sort of sitting around a table and there was just like a glass. It was just like quite weird to see that it was like that was a glass of Mad Dog, like just it just in the side. No, that was that. Oh, no, we're getting into trouble for that. That was uh, that was us playing um, Drinky Christians. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, right, okay, yeah, yeah. Let's okay. let's get drunk for Jesus, that kind of thing. <laughs> and uh, we're getting into no, almost angelic. Google it, it was um. It was like uh, me on the keyboard and her. Well, I remember singing. the dog. I remember who was, I remember who who let the dogs uh -huh, out. We did things like no limits and and uh, <laughs> an age dirt bag and things like that. You know, so it was all songs that that people that then would never ever play, but play um, Super Trooper on our boat in the Clyde, which we actually filmed on location. Uh, there's loads. Of, it's all on YouTube. You can find it. But that was Carl and I had such a hoot with that. We we because we used to do it. Before Karen was ever on the telly, we used to do it in the house. We used to pretend to be these characters. It's sort of based on, was a thing that Joe Stafford did in the 50s and 60s. I can't remember the name of it, but they used to do this bad comedy music duo. Um, but people do people do tend to think it's Robert and May, but it absolutely isn't Robert and May. For a start, Robert creates all these tracks himself. Um, he's not just hitting an accompaniment. He is actually a musical genius. And May... I did a play with May this year, and Robert was the musical director. And May, I tell you, it's a, it's an undiscovered secret. She is a great comic actor, and I wish she would get on. I wish she would do a comedy in the telly, or she would be great in River City. Uh, May, dynamite, an absolute. She's Scotland's Liza Minnelli. <laughs> so take the fuck out of me for saying that. <laughs> I've got to, loads of comments coming, so I've got to rattle through a few here. Okay. Uh, Petra, oh, Tom, I was thinking what a bra face you have. Hope that cheers you up. Oh, Petra, thank you. Uh, Mary Veronica says, great to see you, Tom. My niece was telling me that you made her birthday one year when you sung Bye Bye Miss American Pie on her birthday, 4th of July. It made her day. Thank you so much. Can I remember that, but thanks yeah. a lot. <laughs> um, Angela's been depressed this week herself. I hope you're feeling better, Angela. Thanks um, for telling us, Angela. That's the first step. Uh, and going for a walk helps me. That's, that's great. And then, um, you know, there's loads of things like we've been talking about it uh, quite a lot in this show, just things like yoga and meditation and, mm -hmm. you know, exercise and, and stuff like that as well. So there's, there's lots of things to try out. And it's some yeah. things work for some people and they don't for others. And that's fine as well. But it's just worth trying these things. Absolutely. Well, I do... Uh... I do meditation. I went and did, uh, I went and learned transcendental meditation. Um, I went and did a four day course 
on it. Um, and that's all you need. I mean, there is, you could dive right into it and end up being, you know, a guru and cosmic and all that stuff. But I just wanted to learn how they do it. I wanted to learn the technique. So I went, uh, there's a place in, God, it's in Union Street, actually, the Transcendental Meditation Center. And I went there and I did a four days intensive course on it. And it is a absolutely beautiful experience. It really, really is a, a great way of meditating. And it's helped me so much. And, and I'm, I'm not very disciplined about it. If I was disciplined about it and I did it when I was meant to and as often as I was meant to, uh, it would have a much better effect on me. But it's it's uh, it's not... Uh, I think people, people see meditation very similar to the way they see depression. When you say depression to people, people sometimes think that you're just sad and just cheer up. Just cheer up. You'll be all right. Meditation, I think people think it's just sitting or listening to plinky plonky music. There's, there's actually techniques and um, mindfulness is huge just now. And that's something that I've not done. There's Buddhist meditation, but the transcendental meditation is the thing that really I, I really grasped onto and that I really enjoy and I really like and I find really works for me. Um, and it's easy to do and you can do it anywhere. And I really like that. But I mean, there's a, as with everything, as with everything, there's a load of stuff tied to things and there's all sorts of other things you could do with that. But I just wanted to learn the technique and then keep it and use it. And is, there not any, is, there any, is there anything on YouTube or anything that you'd maybe suggest for people who are maybe just at entry level, just wanting to try something like that out? Honestly, see, see for, for, for basic, just calming down, things like Calm, the app Calm is good. Apart, although there's a woman on it that does a vocal burn thing when she's talking, <laughs> and that just makes me more stressed. Um, find your own way of doing it. Everybody's going to be different. Just get a quiet area, sit down, even just put on your favourite album. Um, a lot of the time, there's an album called Moon Safari by Air, amazing, which, amazing. oh, that that sends me to sleep. I listen to that every night before I go to sleep because it just, it, I tune into it and it, it, it flattens my insane brain waves, that music. So music for me is the main therapy for anything. That's why when I'm not well mentally, I'm plunging into recording and I'm singing and I'm, chucking stuff up online and I'm just producing stuff to keep me busy and to keep me focused. And if I didn't post it on Facebook, they wouldn't feel as if there was a purpose to me doing it. So that's why I do it. That's why you'll suddenly get a, a song coming up in a couple of days time. Even if it's shite, you know, I'll still well, put it up because well, I, I, I need we'll, to. I think we'll do that. I think we'll do that. Uh, we've got quickly, that's so well said, Tom. I've been a mental health nurse for 40 years. I can relate to your personal talk tonight. Thank you, Mary Phillips. Oh, cheers, Mary. Um, Colette says, baby dolls, arrive to your stream. Hey, hope, try the menopause and the depression together. It was shite, but we all come out smelling the roses. Keep smelling. It's bra and grounding. I've not tried the menopause, but I'll give it a shot. <laughs> um, well done, Tom. Inspirational, says James Dickinson. Oh, cheers, James. Thanks, mate. Uh, Sharon, John Byrne is so cool, amazing man. He has got an aura about him that is unbelievable. It's like he's time travelled from the 50s. Oh, what a guy. Someone else agreed with that. Byrne is a genius. I was lucky to be on the construction crew when they made the film of the Slab Boys. Wow. He's great. He's like, he, he, I mean, he looks like an old guy, right? But he's got this energy of a kind of seven, nine, a 17-year-old 1950s beatnik. Um, so you see a picture of him and he looks like this kind of wise old man and then you meet him and you're going, oh, he's a teenager. He's a teenager. And when we were doing that show, he was bringing me stuff in every day. We'd come up and we'd talk, we'd talk like that. You know, we'd talk to, so I've got you these. And he would have been on eBay and got me a pair of vintage braces from the 50s to wear that night. So every night on stage, I was getting new stuff he'd got me from America and I just loved him. I just absolutely loved him. So how about the one, what have we got here? Let's see, is it, uh, the, the, I think it's the, the most recent video you did. So this one, I think, let's just check if it's right. Oh, no. Sorry. What are you going to show? Oh, no, that's the wrong one. That's the, that's, that's the show that we're doing just now. This one is, let's see, this one here. What? Oh, so, okay. Peace, Go for it. Peace coming. Yeah, Caravan of Love. Let's go for that, and um, uh, yeah, we'll come back, and, and if anyone's got any questions, now is the time, 
And um, I, I've loved all, all the videos that you're doing in lockdown, man, and I think many people are. So I think we should, for anyone who's not aware, this is the kind of stuff that you can expect, Don Tom. One, two, three, four. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for the time of your life? Time to stand up and fight. Sorry, sorry. Hand in hand, we'll take a caravan to the motherland. One by one, we're gonna stand up and cry. One that can't be denied. Stand up, stand up. From the highest mountain valley low, we'll join together with hearts of gold. Now the children of the world can see, see. there's a better place for us to be. The place in which we were born, so neglected and torn, torn apart. Every woman, every man, join the caravan of love. Stand up, stand up, stand up. Everybody take a stand, join the caravan of love. Stand up, stand up, stand up. I'm your brother. I'm your brother, don't you know? She's my sister. She's my sister, don't you know? We'll be living in a world of peace In the day when everyone is free We'll bring the young and the old Won't you let your love flow from your heart Every woman, every man Join the caravan of love Stand up, stand up, stand up Everybody take a stand, join the caravan of love. Stand up, stand up, stand up. I'm your brother. I'm your brother, don't you know? She's my sister. She's my sister, don't you know? Are you ready? 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 You call that radio? For the time to call that radio. Bring it back to the people who hate it on me. Right, and then I see the disinfectant that knocks it out in a minute. That's my, that's my, that's my. It's just a Netflix thing. It's actually a, a, a podcast. It's, what the fuck's a podcast? You know, it's um, kind of like a radio show. Oh, that. Radio. <laughs> yeah. Just yeah. Exactly. Yeah, there's a way you can do something like that. I couldn't help it. Uh, injection inside it. Just in there. Yeah, I think so, because all oh, I think pain in general, because I think like, my bones and my pain and... <laughs> No, 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 cut, cut, cut. As you call that radio, uh, we're live with Tom Yuri. Getting back on a little second. Just a quick shout. We're just going to do the adverts quickly. The adverts are finished. 
because we don't have any adverts, we don't have any sponsors. We do this show most nights at seven o'clock. If you want to support the show, then for the price of a pint a month, you can do so by going to patreon.com forward slash you call that radio. Um, I've put the link in the comments if you want to support it. A couple of pounds a month. We're building a thing. And the bigger we build it, the better stuff we can get, the better equipment we can get, the better production values we can get. Tom, you still here? Yeah, did you go for a slash there? It's great. Aye. Aye. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> but I, 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 I've, seen, I've seen it already. No, I, I, it was only a quick slash, so I got most of the song, and I've seen it already. Interestingly, the thing about Caravan of Love is, is the House Martins is uh, Paul Heaton. He actually messaged my band when we were unknown, complete, well, even more unknown. We're quite unknown. The Gyro Babies are still quite unknown. But he just messaged me and says, can I play you on the radio? And I thought it was a wind-up. But he did it. He, he played <sighs> it on the radio. And see, after he did that, all the, the Scottish media that had just been ignoring my band the whole time, they started just sort of going, oh, I will play them on the show as well. So shout-outs to Paul Heaton and all the house martins. Aye. All your, all your fat boy slims and all that. Oh, aye. He was in the house, Martins. Yeah. I've got uh, lots of questions coming in. Pat says, how did you end up crossing over into nightclubs? That is the legendary Pat Mulligan, who runs Mulligan's Online Bar. Uh, In nightclubs, I DJed in the 90s. And um, I, uh, oh man, about three or four years ago, there was a Facebook post up. Uh, looking for a DJ for Club Tropicana and I thought that sounds like a laugh I'll apply for that and I did and I went in for a trial and I got it so uh, it ended up taking off and I know it's now my favourite thing DJing's now my favourite thing out of everything I do Well, well your, your radio show uh, how, how does that differ from your like Club Tropicana because I'd imagine Club Tropicana's got a specific type of thing that you're looking yeah for. it is well, the radio show a bit more <laughs> We've got uh, an '80s room and a '90s room. So uh, in the in the club, it's it's DJing, and we've got a packed dance floor. So there's not a lot of chat. There's the odd, you know, there's shout outs and there's requests and stuff. But on the radio on a Friday and Saturday, I've got to do a lot of the shite patter. Do you know what I mean? But we get a lot of people texting in for requests, and uh, it's just a laugh. It's all '80s and '90s music, and the the, the concept behind it was. Um, when we had to close all the, because there's four Club Tropicana and Vengas, they're called, uh, around Scotland. And we didn't want to lose the the party. We didn't want to lose the kind of contact with everybody that was a regular. So we thought we're going to take it online and then people can have a party in their house, even if it's just themselves, get the speakers on and then do shout outs to their mates that they would normally be go, going clubbing with. So that way we've kept the club open. Um, and we've kept the party going and it's been great every weekend. It's kept me focused and it's kept me DJing, which is my favourite thing, obviously. Um, so it's Friday and Saturday nights and I, I link into a station in our broth, uh, bizarrely, because they've got a kind of network licence. and So I, I just hook up to them. They very kindly let me have five hours every Friday and five hours every Saturday to just take over their airwaves. Um, and it's just a, a hoot. Do you do you actually how, how much planning goes into it? Do you have you got? Do you just kind of go with the flow, or are you yeah. thinking about it? Just take requests. Way? People text in requests, so uh, it's a, it's on Alexa as well. I need to keep my voice down because all the Alexas start. <laughs> uh, it's on that as well. So people use that, and they if they download the skill, I think it's called Westway Radio or Broth. If you download that skill to your Alexa. And then on Friday and Saturday nights, you say, Alexa, play Westway Radio. And then Alexa will play you Tipperary Radio. And then about five more times of you being basically being the guys from Burmiston going 11, 11, it will eventually play. <laughs> eventually. You can listen online as well. If you come to my Facebook page, the the details are there. But it's, it's, it's you know, it's I just do it here. I've got my decks here and um, I've got a little desk and I've got this good mic. So it sounds all right. You know, it sounds fine. And I've got a... One of my mates that works for the company as well fields the calls because I can't do ten things at once. So he gets that he's got the phone that's got the text number, so he forwards them on to me. He probably for, deletes all the ones that goes yes, <laughs> Um So I just get the, the good messages, but uh, it's it's kept me going and it's kept 
it's kept the kind of because uh, I know a lot of the regulars that go to the clubs because I've worked in them for a while and, and it's kept everybody in touch and it's we, we do a quiz every Tuesday night and the prize is a night out when we reopen you know so whenever the, well, that, whenever the fuck that's actually, maybe that's the link for anyone wanting to do Westway, Richie, thank you Richie cheers Call mate slash Westway Radio give that's that it. Fridays and Saturdays that, give that a like thanks um, Richie and he also says I've asked Tom before to do a slot. I think that was in response to James saying, I hope Pat puts you on the virtual bar. He's a, he hasn't asked. He hasn't asked. And Peter has... Gavin says, following you now, got to go, guys. Keep up the great work. Thank you, All right, Peter. Peter. And I'm just going back to that song that we just heard. Uh, Angela says, what a voice done that song proud, Tom. Thanks, Angela. And um, these kind of videos really show what someone can do. Oh, CJ. What a voice. That was beautiful. Oh, thanks, Mary Veronica. Superb version. Oh my God, I always loved this song, Living in My Van at Pet Petty Kirby. And, Petty Kirby. Uh, wow, love this song. Oh, Robert. Robert. Uh, yeah, well, what was what, 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 what um, app are you using? Are you using one of those a cappella apps? No. Or are you just, just doing it on. Uh, no, like what I'm doing, I'll tell you how I'm doing it. I'm, uh, I'm using Logic. So yeah. I've got my mic here, and what I do is I get a click track in my headphones, right? And I sing the lead vocal a cappella all the way through. And then I film myself as I'm singing all the harmonies separately uh, with the backing track on very quietly, so I'm not wearing headphones on, the, on that one. And then I mix all the harmonies together, and then I redo the lead vocal on camera with the headphones on. So I film myself singing each part and then using Premiere Pro, I edit it together. So and then so I divide it up into six it's not an app. I'm having to actually edit it all together myself and record that's it all separately. That together. Is a, that's a shift, man. I, I've got I use Pro Premiere myself. It's, oh, it's great. It's, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. It's I, unfortunately, the I, I need to upgrade my computer or um, and my internet for 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 the green screen stuff, but for the I find that we made a video for a song called Dear Monday with an actual green screen in a studio and stuff. And I got the hang of it and it was quite frustrating because it was actually quite easy to do the whole thing. You just take the colour out and but just yeah. the computer can't can handle it. Do you know what I mean? But Pro Premiere's been amazing. I was I don't know what I was just a bit scared of it for years because it seemed to have so many buttons. So I was using Footery. simpler apps. Because you look but, at iMovie and it's really, really simple, but Premiere Pro, that's footery. And, and I keep, the secret is you just keep going on YouTube and there's some, one of these guys that do these YouTube videos that go, <laughs> hey, what up guys? Today we're going to look at how to, and you know, and they take five minutes of talking shite before they tell you how to do the actual thing. I'm always on YouTube going, how do I mix this? scene and how do I do this transition so that's how I've got through it but Premiere Pro is really really easy to work with and it's really the results you get are good so I'd know I didn't use an app I, I recorded it all separately and then pieced it all together like a maniac yeah, yeah. no it's it, it, it looks amazing I think that it, that's why it looks good because I think when I, I think what I, I had to do learn a whole entire new software for a newsletter I, I, I had to do a couple of years ago and just by being quite scared, of, but I had to do this, learn this whole new software. I just learned, wait a minute, you, you, there might be lots of buttons, but you don't need to use all the buttons. And I think that's good advice for anyone that's maybe a bit daunted by trying to get into a new bit of software. Just let, just lots of YouTube tutorials. We're, we're very lucky to live in a, a world where there's Aye. all you this information. Because I get people saying to me, oh, how, how do you learn how to play the piano? And I go, go on YouTube. There'll be a guy there showing you. Free lessons. You know, there's somebody, any, any answer you need, there's a guy on YouTube's done a video to do Smash it. How do, how do make the Smash the red button. Smash the notification How do I make the perfect cheese toasty? Go on YouTube, somebody <laughs> will spend and, their time. And I'll tell you what, if, if you've not found the answer to it, then it's time to make your own YouTube video because there are other people looking for it. Yeah, oh, it's yeah. good to see you. We've got, we've got an absolute legend in the house. We've got Captain Hot Knives, who I don't know if you're aware of, an amazing singer-songwriter, comedian, it was a first guest on you call that radio. He was in Captain that. Hot Knives. Yeah, amazing man. Honestly, he's just. I'll, I'll send you some stuff after this. Okay. He's one of my one of the funniest. As an actual live performer, I've never. I, I booked him for Kelburn Garden Party last year, and he just had you know about a thousand people just laughing their heads off, which is just I've very unusual to get at a music to, festival. I've got a connection to the Kelburn Garden Festival. Yeah, and it is a. Uh, I, I was down there when they first put the graffiti up in the castle. Yeah. 
um, because I used to do their TV advert. Uh, and Lord de Glasgow used to come to STV and sit in while I was doing Dave. the voiceover. All right, no, I know Dave the Arrow. I think that's the Lord's son. Yes. So yeah, the Lord, I, uh, and I've met, yeah, I've met Dave. I've met Dave and yeah. his sister. They showed me around. So I used to do the Kelburn Castle and Funny Centre. It's a <laughs> great day out for all the family. That was me. So that, so, and, and I kind of, I really liked Lord Glasgow. So he invited me down to have a look around the place. So I did one day and I met, yeah. I, I met David and, no we, actually had Chris, we had Chris Astro Jazz, who's the main booker of Kelburn, on the show on Wednesday night, if anyone wants mm -hmm. to check that out. Because obviously, part of a, they had a, a live, they had to stream it this year, just did a live stream, but they did a great job. Cool. And I think they raised thousands of pounds to pay the artists and so many people out of work that would be relying Brilliant. on the festival scene. So it went, it went well. Shout out to Kelburn. It's yeah. Great weekend. Great, weekend. great and, place. Uh, we've got um, also... Richie says, absolutely brilliant production. Thanks, and Richie. Tom helped me through the toughest time of my life. Yep. Richie had, uh, aye. I've got a lot of pals. And Cameron says, Tom has helped me a lot with my mental health. Even just saying something to anyone about mental health is a weight off your shoulders. It could be something silly on your mind. And you know, um, it, it, it does seem to be a, like when you're, when, you're, when you're depressed or you're anxious, there sometimes it is just like you seem to be getting something little seems to be really playing on your mind. Sometimes by just saying it out loud to someone else, they can give you an easy solution to that one little problem. Obviously, it doesn't make everything go away, but sometimes it is by saying it out loud, you realize well, that maybe you're dwelling on something that can be One fixed. of the best things that can happen is that when you actually reach out to somebody and, and if they're feeling the same thing, you go, oh, it's not just me. I'm not just this awful guy. I'm not suffering, you know, it is a thing that other people are going through. And Cameron that just messaged there is a film student and he made a, a short film uh, last year called Tom Urey Mental Health. And I can't remember what it was called. That's terrible. He'll tell you, he'll comment. And uh, he, he just came up with some film students to my flat and I just talked about mental health the way I'm doing now. But I talked about it from a, I'm brilliant now. I'm much better now, kind of way. Um... And, and I talked about my experiences with it from a point of view of I'm better now, I'm okay. And Cameron edited that together with some really sinister um, visuals uh, because the way Cameron was viewing mental health and suicide was different from the way I was viewing it. So the two, me sitting with a smile on my face saying, I'm okay, but this is how it felt, interspersed with these images, it made a really dark and a really disturbing, but at the same time, a reassuring short film and he ended up winning the Royal Television Society Award for it. Um, he just was, he, he just ran with it and it was great. He, he won the Royal Television Society Student Award for that short film, um, which, God, you could probably find. Um, it's well, only about two minutes put long. A link in, put a link in the comments if you know where it is. Cameron, can you, put, Cameron can you message the link? Because I don't know where it is, but Cameron and Tom that just messaged, he'll be able to message you the link and you can That'd maybe you could probably put it on at the end. That'd be good. How, how long a film is it? It's a couple of minutes. Yeah, aye, we could play that. Uh, that. Petrus is a problem shared. There's a problem half that is indeed. Yeah. Uh, totally. Face Gal and Mark helped me loads with mental health. Thanks. No, thank you, mate. Thank you. You're an absolute legend, and it's good to hear your music. This is a friend of mine who we always knew was an amazing guitarist, but just, just last month, I've known him for 10 years, something like that. He just sent a, a song with him singing. First time I'd ever heard him singing, but he's been hiding this amazing voice. So hopefully get him in the show to do a wee tune soon. Uh, Cameron's going to attach it. Brilliant, Cameron. Cheers, mate. And James saying, consider that being asked now for Mulligan's virtual bar. Oh, um, well, we'll have to see. It's, a, it's an official offer in there now. Um, yeah, amazing. So with them, with music, so the whole setup is... You just record. Do you, do you always ask the audience to pick a song? No, I just did that last week because I was, uh, I was, uh, my usual. It was two in the morning and my my head's gone mad. So I'm like that. Right, somebody tell me a song to do. So I got this big list of people asking. And then somebody asked for Peg by Steely Dan, and I went, "Oh, that's really hard." That's really, really tricky. That's really difficult to do. So I thought I'll do that one because I thought that will keep me that will keep me busy for a couple of days. So it did, and that was the last one I put up. I think. Um, 
And sometimes I'll just wake up in the middle of the night and there'll be a song in my head and I'll go, oh, I'm going to go and do that. And I'll sit and I've got my keyboard here and I've got my guitar there. And uh, I'll just go on with it just to keep busy and just to keep my hand in. Um, I was going to, eh? to ask as well, like, uh, the, like as an actual vocalist, like it's an, you've got an incredible voice. And I'm a, I'm a singer, inverted commas. I, I make do with what I've got. But I just wonder, do you, I mean, do you look after your voice? I mean, obviously you quit the fags, but do you do vocal warm ups or anything like that? <laughs> uh, do you know? I know. I know. I know how to do it. And I know how to look after my voice. And when I'm gigging, I know how to sing properly. About two, three years ago, I ended up getting challenged to do opera. And uh, I went and got opera training and I sang with the BBC Scottish Symphony Orchestra at Glasgow Green. And I sang Ness and Dorma, Pavarotti's Ness and yeah, Dorma. Yeah, I've seen a clip of that, man. That was Did amazing. You? And I had, to, I had to go and get six weeks of this terrifying vocal training. Uh, and it was it was like um, I thought it would just be singing scales and stuff, but it was like it was like intensive workouts because when in opera you're singing from a completely different part of your body and it's a totally different thing. So uh, I had to have six weeks of working up to that and then doing it. So I learned an awful lot doing that about um, about how to maintain and look after your voice. But I went to music college as well, so I I got two years of intensive vocal training there. So I'm not always the best at looking after my voice. I can be as careless as anybody else, but I do know how to I know how to sing through a cold or sing through a bad throat. I, I know how to bypass it. There's techniques, there's exercises you can do. So I I've got a background in vocal training but i'm a bad bad man when it comes to actually doing it in practice it's just something that's, it's just weird that it's something that we singers just overlook if you, unless you actually went to you know we went to a school and you, you actually get taught it it's it just nobody does it really not in the underground circuit really and i i had a an operation and after that i had to i went to my, my first and only singing lesson with sev car who would recommend you check out Sev Khan, amazing singer. And just like that one that one hour, I just learned so much. And more importantly, how wrong I've been the whole time. Like the things I, I was doing were wrong. I was just like, everything was wrong. Voice. Especially if you're singing with a band, it's really it's really easy to damage your voice. And I thought a few years ago, I had a false alarm where I thought I had nodules in my vocal cords and I had to go and get the camera down. They put it right up your nose and right down your yeah, throat. That's what I had. Um, and it was clear. It was clear as a whistle. It was fine. It was just. It was just me. It was just my vocal cords were tired because I wasn't properly looking after them. So now I'm a little bit more disciplined about not attempting to sing something that's going to destroy me. The, the Ness and Dorma thing was a once in a lifetime thing. I'm not going to be trying that again because that was like, that was like doing a workout, and also it was fucking terrifying. It was like musical bungee jumping, and it was in telly as well. It was like if I fuck <laughs> this up, it's going to end up on YouTube and. Um, and it's not my comfort zone, you know. That's why I was doing it because it's not. I'm not. I like opera, but I'm not an opera singer. And I learned to do this one opera song, and I'm glad I did it. It was a thrill, and it was an absolute buzz, and a total privilege. Janie Godley is involved in this story because when that happened, um, she phoned me up the week before and went, "You're doing this big opera thing in the BBC and with the orchestra in front of seven thousand people." I went, oh, and she went, "What are you wearing?" And I went, oh, "I only thought about it." She went, what do you mean? And I went, well, wh why do you have to wear a suit? And can I not just wear my Scooby-Doo T-shirt? And she said, right. <laughs> and I said, and I'm skint, because I was skint. I said, I can't afford to buy a suit. And she went, right, meet me at Slater's tomorrow. So I went and I met Janie at Slater's, and we went up. And honest to God, it was like going shopping with my mother, right? Because the first guy, the first, the first salesman that came out was a bit kind of, yeah, what can we get for you? And and I was like, look, I just I want I want a kind of tux. I want to look like an opera singer. And he brought out this blue tartan suit. And Janie went, you can just take that back. And he went how? And, and he went because he's no fucking Marty Pello, <laughs> right? So it just became this hysterical. And she was there was the guy. Then she another guy came out, and it was like going shopping with my mother. It was like going shopping. I was like, ah, mom. Janie bought me a beautiful suit and beautiful patent leather shoes and she kitted me out from head to toe for that opera appearance 
and she paid for it all. And it was just beautiful. It was a lovely thing to do. It was, it's an amazing thing. I, I wonder if we could, I might try and play it at the end of the show because I I, there might be a copyright issue there. The robots sometimes catch us with the copyright. So I don't want uh, they, they won't if it's um, if it's been broadcast if it's it's not been released uh, on iTunes or Apple or anything it'll be all right. What what clip have you got of it? Well, what I'll do is I'll just I'll bring that I've not got any clip of it. So someone's posted it in the comments. So what okay. I'll do is I'm going to just dig that out because it's uh, someone's. Show me a wee bit of it then, and I'll tell you if it's all right. Right. Okay. Well, well what I'll do is I'll se- I'll send you a link to it. We're going to we've got the we've got the film. We've got uh, the mental health clip here. Mental health. All right, okay. Look, so listen. We'll do that. You know what? Never mind. Never mind the opera thing. We can always. Uh, I, I've not posted it, so I don't know what if it's somebody for the audience has taped it or something. But uh, well, I'll I'll send you a link in the private chat, and you can just check okay. it out while we watch the, this thing, All this right. film, the okay. award-winning film. So let's do that. So this is uh, Cameron. This film. Let's go for that. My name is Tom Yuri, and I'm an actor, musician. Absence of hope. That's the best way I can describe it. You just feel as if there's nothing good going to happen. And I always thought depression was being sad or moaning or... Uh, slashing your wrists, or, or uh, just the, the misunderstanding of what it was. You really genuinely feel that you're not contributing to the world and you're not going to do any good to the world or those that love you. When things get really scary is when you start thinking that the world would be a better place if you weren't there. I guess at the height of my depression, I was in a TV show called River City, and I was playing a character in that, and it was a long-term thing. And it was an escape. Once you're in there, it's like a little world that's separate. So I could go in there and be somebody else, not just the character I was playing, but I could be work Tom. As that character progressed, it started to merge into who I was, so the character became more like who I really was. And he started dealing with things that I was dealing with. So it became very intense for me and it became, I got more ill, I guess. I've been so low and so dark that I've started logically thinking about ending my life. But that's been in a philosophical kind of way. It's not been in control. They lose control and they get grabbed by this thought almost like an electrical spark that jumps in. It felt, the best way I can describe it is it felt like you were in a room that was on fire and the only way to get away from the fire was to jump out of the window and you're 20 stories up. So I was lucky that whatever experience I'd had or whatever knowledge I had was still there at that moment for me to phone my GP and get down there. So I I think that if if somebody is trapped in their own dark little shell, get to a phone, get to a computer screen, find somebody that's talked about it or been there or that you trust and just say, I'm not feeling good and I need help. Once you start, It sort of opens the floodgates. Once you realise it becomes not easy to deal with, but possible to deal with, once you realise it becomes a possibility that you could get out of this, it becomes easier. And the more help you get, the easier it becomes.
educate our children to take their place in the economies of the 21st century, how do we do that? Given that we can't anticipate what the economy will look like at the end of next week. Every country on Earth, on Earth is trying to figure out how do we educate our children so they have a sense of cultural identity and so that we can pass on the cultural genes of our communities while being part of the process of globalization. How do we square that circle? Call that radio makes a coherent sense. Right stuff. Karen. Right, that, that Ness and Dorma clip isn't the one. That's that's me taking the piss at a, a theater. Oh, that's Sorry. not the one I was okay, talking well, about. I didn't, I didn't even check it. That's why I sent it to you because nah, I, nah. <laughs> I don't know if we've got the clip. If someone's got the right clip, then it does. It, it's not. I've I've got it, but it's not. It was uh, It was on the BBC, so it was on the BBC iPlayer. It doesn't exist on YouTube. Um, maybe somebody will sneak it on. Maybe someone will sneak it on. You never know. You never um, know. Um, I was just, just uh, actually uh, one thing that we've not actually really talked about at all is is River City, and I've all, I've never actually spoke to. Well, I've spoke to people who are involved in. We had Cat Hepburn who was involved in a script writer yeah. for a while. So uh-huh. Cat's, Cat's dad Cat's Stuart was a was a script uh, was a story editor. All right, brilliant. Yeah, yeah. And it's just just um, the the whole idea of being in a soap. It's, it's just really quite interesting to me because people are you're actually you're there every day in people's lives people grow attached to the characters and sometimes they seem to get like reality confused with with the character and stuff like that yeah uh yes absolutely now uh two examples of that that happened with me where i was in george square one day do you remember brad pitt came to glasgow and made a zombie film yeah um and I wandered into town to have a look, and I was in George Square, and this woman came up and slapped me in the face, slap. Okay. And I went, I was really taken aback, and I went, what, 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 what is it? What is it? And she went, that's for Marion Tatiana instead of Iona, and she stormed off. <laughs> and of course, it took me a wee minute to figure out what she was talking about because it's not at the front of my head all the time. Do you know what I mean? So she genuinely thought that I was. Big Bob, and then another time that happened. This is brilliant, actually. I was on the boat to Aaron with my pals. Used to go to Aaron every year on holiday. I love Aaron. Mate. I love it's, it too. Best it's place just, in the world. And this wee old lady came up to me and went, "Excuse me, son, can I have a wee word with you?" And I went, "Hi." Was it? She took me aside and she went, "It's no your way." And I went, "What?" She went, "It's no your way." And I went. Who's Norma Wayne? She went, that Tatiana went to Poland and had it off with her ex-boyfriend. She's kidding on, it's yours, it's no your Wayne. And she was really concerned. And, and and so I just went, right, well, thanks for telling me. I had my suspicions. I'll deal with it. Don't you worry. Okay. Thanks for letting me know. I appreciate it. And she went, okay, son, just you stay strong. And I'm like, people do. People think it's, you know, I would get a message saying, all right, see you on Tuesday, going to say hello to Tiffany in River City. You know, it's filmed six months ago, and what would I stop the action and turn to the camera and go, hello, Tiffany? It's just people have got a strange... Um, you know, there was people complaining to the BBC about EastEnders when the lockdown happened because they went, these people in the pub are breaking the lockdown. <laughs> Why is there a crowd in the pub? Because they think it's happening now. I suppose that's another element as well. You've got to keep secrets because it is so far in the past you've recorded it and might be an important, you know, a subject matter. So is it quite difficult to keep your... Do some people try and coax information out of you? Yeah, but you know what? It becomes like a job, right? So you become quite kind of... God, I don't know how to say it without sounding... You become quite kind of detached from it. So it's, a, it's your work. You go at your work and then you come home. So, uh, oh man, you know when Joy Tribbiani's in Days of Our Lives and Friends, <laughs> yeah, and Rachel's like that. What happens next? And he goes, "I don't care." <laughs> it's a little bit like that. People will say, oh, "Who shot Lenny Murdoch?" And I go, "I don't know," because I'm not in that day. I wasn't there. So, I mean, I I, I get it. Yeah, and and as uh, people, the cast are really really good 
at keeping things secret. Nobody, we're all just, everybody's too frightened for their jobs to go blabbing about it. So if any of my mates asked about it, which they don't, because none of my mates are impressed by anything I do, um, I would just go, I, I can't tell you. Or I don't know, I wasn't in that day. Or I'm not in that scene, I don't know. But um, the, 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 they're, a, they're a great setup. It's, it's out in Dumbarton. It's an enclosed little world. Um, so it kind of stays there, you know, and, and uh, people do want to know what's going to happen, but it would ruin the fun if you told them. So everybody's on the same page as far as that's concerned. What about um, Michael Mara's mother, Glasgow? Because oh. what I've got, I've got Michael Mara's mother, Glasgow, and I've got Tom Yuri. What a lovely moment. The amazing Tom Yuri singing Edelweiss, 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 Edelweiss. Edelweiss. Edelweiss, uh, from the sound Edelweiss. of music. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, music, movies to musical concerts. What do you think would be the best one to finish on? Um, if you, if you, see if you go onto my Facebook and find a version of Mother Glasgow on there. Or, or here. have or you, is it, yep. is it look, does it look like um, it's me in a theatre <laughs> mile away? Because there's a version of it that's much better. It's uh, you playing the keyboard. Da, how big am I in it? I'll just I'll bring it on the screen. You can right. see it yourself. Hold on. So it should be this one, I think. So that no, that's that one. So there was either that or where is it? Or this one from your Facebook page. This one. Oh yeah, I play that. That's that's the latest one I did. I did that a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll keep we'll keep that for the end. I'm just going to check see if I'll remove that just now. We've got we've got a grand finale. We've got a grand finale. Ali Grant says, "Mother Glasgow, what a great interview." Says Mary Veronica. Aww. Much respect. Says Richie. Can totally relate to this. Thanks for sharing. I think that's referring to the the film that Cameron made of you. Yeah. Uh, Mary Phillips, again, well said. Hope people listen and seek help. Janie is amazing. Yes. Be good, good to have Janie on the show. Oh, yeah, you should totally get Janie. Yeah. She's great. I played recorder at school. That was it for me. Can I sing to save myself? And, uh, yeah, well, there's been loads of people who tuned in, and I appreciate everyone who has tuned in. Uh, Tom, I really appreciate you, you doing this tonight as well, uh, considering you've doing it. It's been absolutely brilliant to chat to you. Um, CJ is so really inspiring, and yeah, man, it's it's inspiring. It is inspiring to hear because it's it's very easy just to. And obviously, for some people, it is just best. Sometimes you just need to wrap yourself in a quilt and not do anything, and that's fine as well. But that's really what you want to do. That's what you yep. want to do. But I know from experience that that ain't going to help. That's not going to move you forward. You need to get up. You need to have a shower, and you need to talk to somebody. You just need and to do it. With regards to future projects, I'm, I'm assuming, like, right, obviously the, the music scene is, is fucked right now, so there's not much of that happening. With, with filming, I would imagine that filming will start opening up a bit easier because you can socially distance to a point, shooting scenes and having less people involved. Yeah, I mean, well, I've been out of River City for six years now, so I'm not, I don't have anything to do with that anymore, but I know that they are starting back work very soon and they've been... Um, They've been trialing all the, the the ways of doing it, and the the crew out there are incredible. They're the best crew in Britain, seriously. That these guys are amazing, um, and they'll they'll be on top of it. They're so experienced, and they're great at making things look. I mean that. I mean they can make February look like July out there, you know, which is brutal if you're filming in a t-shirt and it's February, <laughs> meant to be July, eating eating a cone with smash on it to make it look like ice cream. Well, I um, I was an extra for Outlander, and uh, it was and it was down in a beach in the air, and it was like six in the morning. And obviously, because apparently they didn't have proper shoes back in those days, you've got like kind of sort of gym shoes, or well, yeah. not even gym shoes, just kind of like a cardboard on your uh -huh. feet, and it was absolutely freezing. Right. And the, I mean, extra, I, I, the extras don't have an, an easy time of it. I, I would, I would, I would, I've actually applied for lots of extra stuff, I've, but I've only really done two, and the one I did before that was a. Uh, a Netflix thing, and it was actually such an easy shift where I just got to sit. It was walking distance from my house, and I just got to... I wasn't really needed, so I was allowed to just sit on my phone for most of the day. 
I was yeah. listening to my iPod, listening to podcasts. I was like, this is easy money. And then obviously that's the, the thing about extras. Sometimes you'll get it easy and sometimes you'll be walking in a circle yeah. all day. And a lot of people do it all the time. A lot of people do it all the time. But um, you, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't thank you for that. I did that a few times back in the day, in the early 90s. I did that a few times, but it wasn't for me. But no, filming-wise, um, guilt that I did last year, which became a huge cult hit. Uh, I don't know if you saw it. Did you yeah, see it? I've, I've not Aye, seen it yet. I've not seen it yet, right. but it's on my it's on my to watch list. I loved that. I just just loved doing that, and it's just been recommissioned for a second series now. I don't know if my character is going to be back. Um, I, I doubt it actually. Gordy Gemmel. Eh? Gordy Gemmel. Gordy, aye. His mother yeah. was a, his mother was killing all the neighbours. They have ruined the plot now i've ruined the story um <laughs> so that's coming back for a second series i don't know if i'm going to be on it i hope i am because wow it was such a great experience but i don't the character kind of left so probably not but that would be great if i could do that but uh and i also got to work with glenda jackson last year who is a two-time oscar winner legendary old actress i did a thing called elizabeth is missing with her last year and that just was blew my mind that I got to work on a one-on-one -on -one scene with this incredible actress who had grown up watching and who was so legendary. Google her, Glenda Jackson, my God. Um, so last year I had loads of great acting work and loads of different things. So um, I, last year was the best year of my life work-wise. This year is the shittest year of my life work-wise. But it'll balance out, do you know what I mean? It'll balance. Well, we'll all work again. We'll all be fine. We've been talking for two hours and we still haven't even mentioned train spotting. Oh. What was that like? It was dynamite, and I'll tell you for why. Um, it was I did four days on it, right? Now, uh the first two the first three days were in the Orb in Bells Hill, which was the upstairs part of a pub, and they had blacked out all the windows, and there was 200 extras there. And it was the hottest day of the year. And uh, I had developed a chest infection because I was a bigger boy back then, right? And I used to get a lot of chest infections. And um, so I was cough, 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 cough all day, right? So um, the extras were all people from the places of the characters they were depicting is the, probably the best way I can put it. There was a lot of people from that background, if you know the scene I'm talking about, right? Yep. So I had been given all these movie tattoos. So I I, I was brought up in a family that I, I had no idea about Catholics and Protestants. I don't, I still don't, I've, I've never, I've never been, it's never, I'm never, not from a religious family. We didn't have any of that. So I don't understand the, the whole Catholic Protestant thing. So I'm oblivious to all this. I don't know what anything is. So they gave me all these tattoos. So I had 1690 on my neck. I had the red hand of Ulster on my arm. And I had King Billy on that arm, right? And uh, at the end of the day, because the, these they were movie tattoos, so they took hours to get on and off so that you didn't sweat them off. They were really, really quality stuff. So um, at the end of the day, the makeup artist said to me, look, do you mind keeping these on overnight? Because we'll just need to spend an hour taking them off and then spend an hour putting them back on tomorrow. Would you mind? And I went, no, that's fine. Cough, 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 cough. So the producer, the assistant producer came up to me and said, look, can you go and just for our insurance purposes, can you go and see a doctor tomorrow morning before you come in, try and get an emergency appointment just to check out this cough? And I went, yeah, no bother. So I went to the doctors. I thought, my, my doctor's cool. I, I got an appointment right away. And I went to the doctors the next morning and I was sitting there in the waiting room and I didn't know why everybody was staring at me. Why is everybody staring at me? And then went into the doctor's surgery and she just looked at me and went, what's that in your neck? And I went, oh, I've still got all the tattoos on. So I'd been sitting in the doctor's surgery with 1690 there. And then, oh my. But it was wonderful. Danny Boyle, who directed it, is such, such a nice guy. By the end of these two days, he knew everybody's names. I got to spend three days with Ewan McGregor and Johnny Lee Miller, which was incredible. And then w one of the, the weirdest things about it was I had to go back six months later and do a reshoot um, because in the scene that I was in, it was me stopping Ewan McGregor and Johnny Lee Miller from leaving the club and telling them to go up and give us a song. And the way they had filmed it from the front, there was a staircase behind me. 
But then when they did the exterior shots, it was a one level pub. So they were doing reshoots and, and they said, can you come back and uh, we're just going to get a pub in Clyde Bank. Can you come back and do the front shot? So the front shot of me saying the line, and you can see the back of Ewan McGregor and Johnny Lee Miller's heads. That's not them. That's Lukey Likey's. But the oh, front is, is them. So I was doing the scene with them originally. But during this time, in the interim months, I had had gastric surgery to lose weight, right? So by the time I was going back to film, I had lost five and a half stones. Wow. So if you look, if you freeze frame train spotting two, and you see me from the back, right? My neck's like that. And then when you see me from the front, it's like <laughs> And they had to go out and get a t-shirt two sizes smaller for the front shot. So the front shot and the back shot was, were filmed six months apart and about six stone apart as well. It was crazy. But what an experience, honestly. And then when it came out, um, and I didn't know if that scene was going to be in the movie because they'd filmed loads of extra stuff and they had warned us that a lot of stuff was getting cut. And I remember at the, the premiere, the Glasgow premiere, me and two of the other actors sitting there and it came on and I went, oh my God, I'm either <laughs> going to get pelters for this or it's going to be a laugh. Luckily, everybody liked it and everybody on both sides of that camp all thought it was hysterical, so I got away with it. That's but it was a great show. experience. Just what a beautiful experience working in that film. I think it was such a, a a great film as well. I think that a lot of it was really it was like how are they going to follow up? And I, I like the way that kind of just came at it from a totally different angle. It was a nostalgia thing, and see when and and I think if you were there in the nineties and you saw the original Train Spotting when it came out, you saw Train Spotting too differently. You saw it from a kind of <gasps> I remember where I was when I first heard Born Slippy, you know. So when in Train Spotting two, when that first chord of Born Slippy comes in, you go. <gasps> And it catches you, and you go, oh, God, that was 20 years ago. It's more than 20 years ago now, I but it, it really, it takes you back. And and I'm, and I'm the same age as the characters, so you're like, uh, just for, for, for guys my age, Trainspotting 2 was a real nostalgia fest. And I, I loved the story, and I loved the way they did it, and it was just great. I really, really, really liked it. Oh, I remember it. I was uh, young, old enough, young enough to to enjoy it when the first time it came out it was it was just something really cool really inspiring to see something from scotland being shot so well and it was just a, a big film for me also Aye. got me into reading books and stuff like Irvin Welsh it was like because obviously Irvin Welsh books that you were like well, this is actually our language and it takes you a few attempts to kind of get the accent in your head but once you watch the film there's no stopping you yeah and, uh, it just it just things like that do inspire generations of people to just you know, stay true to your own voice. Don't be ashamed to be Scottish. Don't be, you don't need Absolutely. to do it. And the soundtrack. Uh, I mean, the soundtrack the for the second movie was just as, just as good. The Young Father stuff was incredible. Young Father's perfect. Oh. Rubber Bandits. I love the Rubber Bandits oh, as well. God. Blind Boys, <laughs> got a great podcast. i tell you what, i tell you one thing. Um, at the end of the third day in Bells Hill, when everyone had gone home and I had to stay on later, for, so I can't remember why I had to stay on, and Danny Boyle came up to me and uh, he's not a lot of directors will just you know direct you and that's it. But Danny Boy came up to me and went, Look, um, I'm staying for some food. Do you want to join me for some food? And I went, Aye. So I, me and Danny Boyle sat and had dinner and he told me he'd bought my CD off Amazon, right? Because I'd released a CD years ago when I was in River City and said, oh, Yeah, I bought your CD when I saw your name. And I went, Oh my God. And he told me stories and he talked about all the music that he'd chosen for Train Spotting 2. He told me about the Young Fathers. He told me about the the song, you know, the the song that they sing in the Orange Lodge and Train Spotting Two, was yeah. written by the guy from Underworld. What? Wrote Born Slippy. He wrote it. <laughs> aye, aye. So uh, he's just sat and we chatted and we talked about stuff and we talked about uh, the fact that I was going to be doing this weight loss thing and and he just was a really 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 positive, nice, lovely guy, Danny Boy. What a guy! Um, and when I came back. Uh, months later to do it, he showed me a lot of the movie on his laptop and sat and spent time with me and just, he didn't have to do any of that. I was in it for two minutes, you know what I mean? But a lovely, lovely guy and a great experience. Well, it was, it, we had Gary Fraser on the show recently. Gary Fraser was the assistant director. I don't know if you met him on, on the set. Aye. Oh, yes, I know exactly who you mean. Yeah. Uh-huh. So it was an interesting story how he got involved as yeah. well in that. And that's um, all down to Danny. So much, much respect to Danny. 
Absolutely, and he used the the oh what the, the name of the the athletic uh, Callum Athletic, who had been in the original movie, got all them back for the second one as well. So all the guys that are dancing with me with their shirts off on the dance floor, that's all the Callum Athletic guys. Oh, um, right. yeah, and they're all addiction uh, recovery people as well. So we we got on well. Amazing man. Well, Tom, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you tonight. You too, uh, buddy. It's we got couple more comments then we'll wrap it up uh, glenda is involved in politics too yeah she was a labor politician for many many years and she didn't make a movie for 25 years the first thing she did was elizabeth is missing the thing that i got to do with her yeah i'm gonna check that out tonight mary phillips oh my god i'm an outlander stalker <laughs> well i don't know if i'm in it or not i was definitely there but i don't know if i got used I've not, I don't watch, I haven't watched Outlander. I'm not sure. I'm just look out for me. I'll be in the background looking very cold, pulling a rope where I think it's like sand, a bucket of sand going up and down. That's what I did all day. I don't think I'm in it. No, nobody's, nobody's tagged me. I'm wait, so I'm sure I'm not in it. Or maybe it's just so subtle in the corner that maybe I'll need to watch it to, to spot it. Uh, Ali Grant, I, it's been amazing listening to you, Tom. Really honest. It'll give folk a lot of reassurance. Thanks, Ali. Alan. Rorison really enjoyed this interview tonight. Thanks, pal. Thank you, Alan. Um, much respect, Mark. First time I've listened to on You Call That Radio. Well, Richie, there's a whole bunch of, we've done, I don't know, we must be getting about 80, 80 or 90 episodes since lockdown began. Uh, you'll find most of them on YouTube and stuff like that. And yeah, there's lots and lots and lots of comments that I didn't get to read out. Sorry, guys. But sometimes, see, when I start getting too comment friendly, it just becomes something else. Do you know what I mean? So, um, Glenda Jackson is a legend. Great show. Thanks, Mark and Tom. Thank you, Petra. Thank you, Angela. Thank you to everyone who's tuned in. If you want to support the show, there's a wee Patreon link in the corner. It's the price of a pint a month, and you'll get automatic entry into our big mad raffle, so you can win things as well. We're going to end with a song from Tom. Can you tell me what this song means to you? Yeah, um, I first came across this song when Hugh and Cry did it early in the 90s. And um, I I got in tour with a guy called Ross Gunning who runs the Glasgow Philharmonia Orchestra. And I had always wanted to do Mother Glasgow with an orchestra um, because I think it's a stunningly beautiful song and the lyrics of it really capture Glasgow. You know, it's not talking about anything specifically in Glasgow, but it talks about you know, the saints and how they guard their wains and all this kind of stuff. And it was written by Michael Mara from Dundee. And so it was a thing that I did in conjunction with the Daily Record. We recorded, uh, we just recorded a video for the Daily Record of this song. And then um, when the when the George Square bin lorry crash happened, we got back together and we recorded it to put it out for the Lord Mayor's Fund. So we got back into the city halls in Glasgow, not the city halls, the Henrywood halls with the full orchestra and recorded it again. Um, and it was an arrangement I had done on the piano and then they got an orchestral arranger in to do it. I can't remember the guy's name, that's terrible. And then Ross was the conductor. And I got in touch with Michael Mara's family because Michael passed away about four or five years ago. So I got in touch with his wife, Peggy, and his daughter Alice and son Matthew in Dundee and asked their permission to do this and to release it and they gave it their bless and they listened to it and they went, yep, that's fine, go for it. So it's a song that really means the world to me and when I recorded this version that you're about to see, it was about two weeks ago and I was breaking my heart, missing my pals and missing George Square and missing Glasgow and going and meeting everybody and it was the middle of the night and I just I set up three cameras, uh, I set up my my iPad and my phone and the uh, the PC camera and I just sang it live and recorded it and then edited it together and so it's just a pure live performance of me sitting really missing my home city even though I'm sitting right bang in the middle of it because it's shut you know and <laughs> it's just shut it's shut the new so this is a homesick song it's me being homesick for Glasgow and uh, Peggy uh, Michael Mara's wife said I, she, she put a comment up saying good on you, so I, I know I've got their blessing to sing it. Oh, amazing, man. Thank you very much, Tom. All the best, and I hopefully see you soon, mate. Thanks, pal. Cheers, man. And
And the second city of the empire, Mother Glasgow watches all her wings, trying hard to feed her little starlings. Unconsciously, she clips their little wings. Mother Glasgow's sucker is perpetual, nestling the belly and the tim. I dream I took a dander with Saint Mongo. To try to catch a fish that couldn't swim. Among the silent bells and flightless birdies, Father Glasgow knows his starlings well. He'll no make his own way up to heaven by waltzing all his charges into hell. Mother Glasgow's socket is perpetual, nestling the belly and the tim. A dream. I took a dander with Saint Mongo to try to catch a fish that couldn't swim, and the tree, and the fish, and the bird, and the bell. Let Glasgow fly. I got you. I got you. Yeah, one, two. One, two, one, two. Yo, this is Charlie Tuna from Jurassic 5 Live and Direct here in Glasgow, Scotland, and you call that radio? You. We are here to tell the people that we hear you. One God will not allow us and people of conscience to lose our morale. We see the crimes of this government, how they support every dictator and criminal on this earth. Sometimes you can feel down. Sometimes you're